Nós vamos, então, dar início à última sessão, último painel do nosso seminário, é, e justamente com o um tema que é o Wiki Pesquisas e Cadernos Científicos Abertos, que é um tema que vem aparecendo recorrentemente ao longo de todo o evento, desde as oficinas né, até as, as outras sessões. Inclusive, na última sessão, já tivemos uma prévia do Peter a respeito dessa, dessa abordagem, né, desse tipo de prática, de iniciativa, de proposta. E a gente vai fazer... Bom, então, a ideia é nós termos três apresentações e seguida de debate, a gente faz um intervalo para o café e aí a gente vai ter uma pequena homenagem ao Jean-Claude Bradley. Né? E a gente, depois a gente fala um pouquinho sobre isso. E a ideia é reservar ainda um pouquinho de tempo ao final para fazer um balanço, possíveis desdobramentos, enfim, ter algum tempinho para ter alguma conversa ainda final, antes da gente deixar aqui o, o auditório. Né? O, o Alexandre já foi apresentado no início, né? ele vem da Universidade de São Paulo, doutor de, em Física, está é, como pesquisador de pós-doutorado na Faculdade de Medicina da USP, né? e ele tem estudado intervenções de integração e colaboração na rede de atenção do Sistema Único de Saúde, né? e a relação disso com, com a população. Bom, depois ele me corrige se aqui estiver errado. E é, tem sido aí uma pessoa bastante ativa na, no Grupo de Ciência Aberta, no, no Brasil, na Open Knowledge Foundation, no Brasil, em, em nível internacional, e é um dos organizadores é, desse evento. Né? O Cameron já foi apresentado ontem pelo pelo Alexandre, né? ele é da University of Western Australia, é PhD em Química, e ele faz, ele é Advocacy Director da, da PLOS, que é essa Public Library of Science, né? que tem sido uma, uma experiência importante né? na, na prática de publicação é, científica aberta e de acesso aberto a dados. Né? Também é um dos coautores do Panton Principles for Open Data in Science. Né? E ele tem um blog muito ativo, que ele mantém escrevendo sobre as questões é, sociais, técnicas e políticas da pesquisa aberta. O Matthew Todd também vem, é da área da Química, PhD em Química Orgânica, da Universidade de Cambridge. É, e ele é professor na School of Chemistry da Universidade de Sydney. Ele se interessa por ciência aberta, especialmente em como ela pode ser utilizada para acelerar as pesquisas e a descoberta de códigos abertos de drogas, né, de fármacos e seus catalisadores. Então, eu vou convidar o professor Cameron para fazer a sua. Ah, ele já está aqui. Both sort of special and, and, and important um, for me. One of the things that I was really looking forward to um, in coming to this meeting um, was to see Jean Claude Bradley. Um, because I hadn't actually spoken to him for, for several years. And um, as, as you know, he, he, he died suddenly um, and has left us to reflect and to think about what, what it was that his legacy was, what it was he was talking about, what he meant when he talked about open notebook science, about open in, in general, because he meant some very, very specific things by it that are not necessarily the same as, as the, the, the stories and the assumptions we make when we talk about things like open source and open data. And he would have given a talk in which he would have expressed those principles very powerfully. He would have given examples of exactly what he had done. Um, and he would have challenged us to live up to the standards that, that he applied in his day-to-day -day work. And, and I would have followed that by talking about some of the examples of what, what we've done and what I have done and have been involved with um, in attempting to take the record of research as it happens directly online and making it immediately available. And the challenges and the technical solutions that get you part the way there, but not always the whole way there. So I'm left slightly bereft in that I don't have the introduction that he would have given. And so I thought rather than talk about what I have done, um, I take this opportunity to let him speak through some of the resources that he created. Um, so what I've done is I've actually taken four or five of his presentations 
um, I can do this. He put them online. He made them available. He made them available in a form where I can download them, where I have the license to reuse them. And I've just strung them together um, and put them on auto advance. And so I want you to see these slides, not as something where you're going to read every word. Um, and you'll see some of the slides come back over and over again. There's also a time element here. There's the first presentation comes, as you'll see, from, from 2007, the last one from actually six or seven months ago. And I just want to respond and react to these slides as they go past and pull out the things that I think, for me, um, were a result of what he meant um, and see how that works. So this is both, both experimental performance art um, as well as hopefully an introduction to the way he thought about what he was trying to do. And we start with disease and with malaria and, and, and Matt will talk more about this. This is the point also where I wonder whether the auto advance actually works. And one of the amazing things about how Jean-Claude got into this was that he actually chose the problem of malaria by typing into Google an important unsolved problem is. And the answer he got back was malaria. So he was already talking about the mechanisms by which you could use computers to inform you about what was important, to get that input from the outside world, both computationally and as a result of what people had done. And in doing that, he came across this problem of, of drugs for malaria, and he found a particular drug target, a particular class of molecules. And so fixed on the idea of making large sets of molecules that might be valid targets for malaria, having no knowledge or no idea of how he might test these molecules, having no one, no collaborators actually in place to be able to test these as potential anti-malarial compounds. But he chose to do this starting on a blog by making the daily record of what he did online. And you've seen the slide that Peter Murray Rust showed earlier today where he selected this term, open notebook science, as a way of homing in on, on some really critical aspects. One was open and the, the sense in which um, it was inspired by open source software. One was the science but the focus on the notebook, the focus on making the data, the spectra, the elements of the record available in some form. And one of the important things to note about what he was doing was that he was appropriating technology over and over again. He would use whatever tools would come to hand, whatever people would come to hand. And that was one of the reasons he got heavily into social media, partly because he was motivated by the educational opportunities, but also because he was trying to get into contact with people. I should also note, I haven't actually looked at what these slides have on them. So he would take tools, and he took tools like Second Life. And anyone remember Second Life? <laughs> it still exists. It's actually got really quite good. Um, but he appropriated it both as a tool for communication, for running seminars, and for teaching, um, but also as a visualization environment, as a visualization environment that would allow people to interact with molecules in a way that wasn't readily possible. And he would use these, these technologies uh, to, uh, to apply them to, and this is an example of a, a video, he was also involved using um, YouTube very early on to put records of experiments online. Again, some of the questions around tacit knowledge in experiments, how do you really know how the experiment was done? He was one of the first people to actually just do a video, stick it on YouTube, embed that in the blog. But Second Life was, is perhaps the thing that really illustrates to us, I think, in many ways, what it was that he was very skilled at. Taking a technology that was intended for something entirely different and was not actually an open and still is not an open technology. That didn't really bother him. The concept of whether something was open the layer below was never something that he actually troubled himself with very much. What mattered was that people could access it and use it. And it's interesting, actually, that I got these slides from SlideShare, and it's clear that the first sort of six or seven presentations he put on SlideShare, he forgot to change the setting to allow me to download them. 
And so those presentations are things that we'll no longer be able to access in some way. We won't be able to get the actual slides unless someone happens to know what his password is. So there are questions that we do need to ask. And, and, and Jean-Claude was always pushing at the boundary of what was possible. And a lot of what he was doing was intentionally ephemeral, despite the fact that he was actually engaged in things that were all about the quality of recording. But you can see, again, this is Second Life. And you, this is Jean-Claude the cat. That was the other thing you need to know about Jean-Claude. He had a lot of cats. He cared a great deal about cats. But... Um, the, the, the way in which and the many ways in which he used a technology like Second Life, like other social media, to engage with people and connect with people was, it was an incredibly powerful way how he operated. And yet at the same time, he was incredibly uncompromising. It could be very difficult to work with because you only got to work with him if you worked by his rules. The principles were important um, and the principles that he didn't think were important, he didn't really think were important. So another important aspect of his work, I think this is the third presentation now, is, was how he embedded education and research and research in education. Um, again, you're seeing the Second Life images come up. But in particular, the way he would use the research he was doing as a way of illustrating to undergraduate chemistry students how research was actually done in practice and how he used the record keeping standards that he tried to apply to people to really teach students how to express themselves in a, in a rigorous, replicatable way. Um, many of us worked with him on uh, a program, and I don't, couldn't find a slide deck on this, on a, on a prize we called the Open Notebook Science Challenge. And the challenge was to do measurements of the solubility of compounds in, in organic solvents. It's something that's actually surprisingly difficult to do and surprisingly difficult to measure. But the whole point of the exercise, the prize went to the student who in that month had done the best job of describing what they'd done. Not the student who'd done the most, not the student who'd done the most impressive or even in some ways the most clever thing, but the one who could describe most effectively and in most detail how they'd actually done the experiments. And that became critically important as we started to understand why this was a very difficult measurement to do. You're driven in large part by, by our naivety. But as those compounds got released and as the spectra got released, you will have seen several of the chem spider slides go past as well. So Jean-Claude was putting spectral data into these, these emerging platforms, maybe not completely open platforms, but, but where he could make the data available. And then using that data to bring it back into teaching examples Again, Second Life is a 3D visualization environment. It's an appropriation of, of technology. I wonder whether we're going to come back to the spectral game again. But you, I don't know whether you saw that go past, but there was a game that was basically built on, could you assign a spectra, a chemical spectra in, in real time? Could you decide which molecule? And those spectra were real spectra. They came from real molecules that were part of the research process. I have no idea what that is. Um, these are still, you, you, you are getting the impression here of how widely he was using Second Life. So this is, this is a, a, an interesting story. And it, it, it really illustrates some of the important things. And when we come to the final presentation, actually, the, the way he thought and the way he was open to ideas in a really quite radical way. So the point, the point of what he was trying to do and the, the way this malaria project evolved was to try and identify a chemical reaction which would provide sufficient chemical diversity to make lots of molecules that some of which might be anti-malarial compounds but also to um, do a synthetic reaction where the product of the reaction actually just crashed out of solution so you can mix a set of liquids together and the product would be a solid and this is important because it makes, potentially makes manufacture cheap but it turned out it was very difficult to predict the solubility of these compounds in organic solvents. And so this led down, again, in a classic sort of Jean-Claude way to say, well, okay, so we need to measure solubility. How we do that? And we spent, he came to my lab, and we spent a week in my lab with tubes, 
spread across the, you know, taking compounds, trying to dissolve them in various solvents, heating them up, cooling them down, weighing the tubes. And it really came out of the fact that it turned out that the data in the literature was garbage. The actual information either didn't exist or was completely wrong. And there was a, I think it, the slide's actually gone past, but there were two reports where someone had misplaced the decimal place in a quantity by two orders of magnitude. And this made a critical difference to a whole bunch of things, but it was one of the reasons why no one had successfully been able to build good models to predict this important physical characteristic. And what came out of this, and this is a story we've now heard several times with things like Galaxy Zoo and data collection efforts more generally, is that if you can create large, high-quality data sets, then you can actually take things that are difficult phenomena to study, difficult things to wrap your head around, and really help people to build predictive models that are actually useful. And it turned out this data set, this data set that was pulled together by students spread around the entire globe, operating often in teaching labs, because of this iterative process of both figuring out how to do the measurements, which was a collaborative process, but also a process of curating that data and comparing it and doing replicate measurements and doing all of this in the open and collecting it together made it possible to create these predictive models, that data could support theory, and then the theory could be used to support data. And so these physical questions, I, so I have a, I have a slight um, ax to grind when it comes to chemistry, which is that physical chemistry is probably more interesting than molecular chemistry, but, but Matt can disagree with me on that. Um, but it turns out these physical chemical properties, boiling points, melting points, um, solubilities actually can have a much bigger effect on what is going on um, than in many cases what we think of as the specific chemical interactions. And over and over again, this, this just happened regularly, he would identify a data point in the literature, in the literature or in the databases that was wrong. And it was wrong because someone had mistyped a number and then someone had copied a mistyped number. And they copied it again and again, and maybe they'd lost a decimal place along the way. And in the process of doing this, he consistently would find that the records of where that data had come from were a problem. And this you know, led back to this motivation that he didn't want to have to trust those numbers. He wanted to see the real evidence, how the data was collected, how the numbers were generated. How to actually make that available through Wikipedia was one way to do it through the lab notebook was at the core of what he was doing repeatedly. And again, you see some of these slides, you see you have a sense of what it was that mattered to him, the data, the description, those slides of spectra, the slides of the videos, the records of the reaction keep coming back. The evidence that underlies how you can really show to someone how these experiments are working, how you can collect the data together is one of the earliest users of um, Google Apps scripts. So putting things in Google Docs and then using the Google Doc to actually call various APIs, various sources of information, to process that data in some ways. And then appropriating things like Lulu to actually print these as books. Because it turns out you actually, where's the place where you want to know these solubilities? Well, it's in the lab, where you probably don't want to bring your laptop in. So printing it off as a book actually turns out to be a really sensible thing to do. But because it's on Lulu, every time you update the PDF, and it was a PDF, I'm afraid, every time you update the, the text of the book, you can release a new version. Because it's print on demand, it's easy to keep doing that. And he would always see those potentials and see those possibilities. And getting other people to build the web services that allowed to do this in practice. I don't think I need to read that out, but it's, you know, transparency is possible if you choose to do it, was central at the point of what he was doing. So he did ask questions about what he meant by openness, and I, I, I would recommend going back to some of the early discussions. My, one of the illustrations of who Jean-Claude Bradley was, that when I, the first blog post I wrote um, was about what I was going to try and use open to mean, what I would 
choose open notebook science to mean. And I had put this blog post up on a platform. He commented 20 minutes later, said, welcome to the community. You know, let's have a conversation about this. Let's take it forward. And he would do that consistently. He was very focused on engaging people, providing opportunities for people to contribute finding that the technologies and the systems, and he rejected blogs as the choice of lab notebook, in part because it wasn't easy for other people to come in and edit and correct and comment, which is why he moved to systems based on wikis. Um, and again, you know, Matt will tell you some stories about the technologies and the different forms of lab notebook and how it, some of them are easier to interact with in some ways than, than others. And you can tell, so now we're getting into the app age. This is, this is a presentation, I think, from about 2011, 2012. And again, he got someone else. He got some students who knew about writing iOS apps to engage in building these, building these things. Oops. Interesting. Is it back? Yep, it's back. Goes, went to sleep. I don't blame it, really. Um, he'd bring these, he's bring these people in to work on these things, and always, always at the cutting edge of the technology, always testing the boundaries, always trying to figure out how this new tool, this new system, whether it was Second Life, whether it was apps on a phone, whether it was web services in Google Docs, whether it was some sort of new social media, he would be there testing it to see what it could deliver in terms of connecting with people, connecting with data, or keeping better records. And again, always the, the, the quality of the data, the, the scale of the data, and the way it can be used to help other people. But always, always, always coming back to the lab notebook. And that was the definition of what he was talking about, that this record, this record could be made public, and that was now a choice. And yeah, previously it was on paper and it wasn't a choice. But that it made it very difficult to cheat, but it also was a difficult thing to do. That it was actually, there was real value in the discipline of forcing yourself. And he forced the students. Um, students were not always happy about the fact they were not allowed to go home until their notes had been transcribed onto the online lab notebook. Again, this was in the days before you would take computers into a lab, um, both because computers were rather expensive um, and also because it was a chemistry lab, so it's not necessarily a great idea. But that sense of the importance of the record as being at the heart of science, and it's interesting actually in many ways, um, after he died, there was a scrabble amongst several of us to ask the question, what, what of the records that he had made were well archived? What was available and what was not available? And the lab notebooks had already been archived. They were all available, they were still there, everything was there, the blog. Um, on Blogspot, a Google property, all there, all preserved, and it turned out the university had already archived it. His trace on social media, the stuff on FriendFeed, which you saw some, some screenshots of, is largely inaccessible. And so in a real sense, the, the discussions, the conversations, which actually from where I sit at the moment are actually perhaps the most important part of what we gain from him, those conversations where he challenged us repeatedly to make better records, to keep better records, to define what we were doing more clearly. Um, those things we may have lost, and people are looking in to try, and they're probably on a hard drive somewhere. Uh, FriendFeed was bought by Facebook. Uh, Fa FriendFeed hasn't been updated at all, but it still runs, it's still there. Um, but the question of whether those, those conversations, those records, they, you, you can sometimes pick them up with a Google search but they're hidden. So where does that leave us? Um, it leaves us with a loss. It leaves us um, without a person who perhaps more than any of us um, would push continually, would always drag us further and further towards an open, an open practice, a transparent practice, a better record keeping practice it gives us the opportunity to reflect on, on what it was he achieved and wrapped up in that, in that term. Um, simply the idea that this is possible. You know, I remember talking to him 2005, 2006, and 
I just gone and put my lab notebook online. Um, Matt was in the process, I think, around the same time of doing some. And there were two or three, literally two or three, other people around the world who were thinking about doing this. And everyone thought we were barking mad. Several people thought we were in violation of our employment contracts for leaking IP to the outside world. The world has moved on. The world has shifted. He shifted that pendulum towards a place where actually it's not that uncommon. There are many groups around the world who put quite a lot, maybe not all of it, maybe not immediately, but particularly in computational biology, who place those records online, who create those resources and make them available. And as Peter mentioned, the tools have got an awful lot better at enabling this to happen. But I think in the end, the contributions he made are, are, are twofold. One was to challenge us to be better at doing this, to ask the question. I will forever, in the back of my head, have his voice saying, could you not make that available quicker? Could you not make that clearer? Could you not make a better record? And at the same time, the practical result of changing our assumptions and making it something that it's not that strange to do, that the record can be online, it can be open, and it can be there for anyone to use, discover, and to create new collaborations out of. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and uh, well, thank you for the uh, invitation to come and talk. And um, that's a great introduction from from Cameron to a lot of the really uh, important and relevant issues. Um, uh, and I would like to. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about um, some of the work that we've done on a project called Open Source Malaria. And I, I need to give you a little bit of background about what that is, so it, it, so it makes sense. Um, but then the reason I, I chose this title was because I wanted to try and track through from how you get from uh, working in a very open way. Um, we call it open source malaria, but by that term I mean open notebook science. So it's a completely transparent work process. In an area which is um, normally associated with the requirement for intellectual property, um, through to public publishing that work in its entirety. So I just wanted to track that through to show that by working in, the, in, the, in a completely transparent way, you don't somehow ruin the ability to work in a, in a way that is seen as being good in an academic sense. Because some people worry about that. They worry about, if you, well, if you release everything, then how do, you, how do you then do academic work? Because people are going to scoop you, or you can't publish it, or you're not going to get it funded, and this kind of stuff. So I want to track through that process. Um, and just to start with, I need to talk about a couple of past projects. A, a couple of you in the audience have seen these slides before, so sorry about that, but the rest of you haven't. Um, so the, uh, the first project we did uh, in, in open science um, of any kind was to do with this disease called Bilharzi or schistosomiasis, which is essentially mostly a, a sub-Saharan African disease. It's a parasite that lives in your blood. Very, very widespread. And this drug here, uh, which has a very simple molecular structure, is very good at treating that disease, so that's fine. But it's very bitter because uh, one of the mirror image, you, you heard about thalidomide, there's a one mirror image form of the drug is good for you and one is bad for you. Um, this is the same. Um, one of the mirror image forms of this drug kills the parasite very effectively. The other one is bad for you and tastes really terrible. So people who are given this drug don't take it because it's a very bitter taste. Anyway, so WHO, uh, we were working with WHO to try and make this pill uh, in the better form, just with the active form, without the price going up. And that's very hard to do because as soon as you start researching something, the price goes up. Um, and this is very inexpensive. So this is an off-patent drug. Uh, there's no way of easily solving this problem. So um, we wanted to uh, work with everybody on the web at the same time because that would speed up the way of solving this problem. It was a, a problem that was completely impossible to do in three years, um, even though we said we could do that in our grant proposal. Uh, it's, it's, it's nonsense. So we, we did the proposal. It said in, in the proposal, we'll work in an open source manner, right? Bring everyone in because that will solve the problem faster if everyone works together on the internet at the same time. Um, uh, and that, that was the concept. And of course, anyone in software, that's a, that's a no-brainer. But in experimental lab-based science, where you've got chemicals and, and biological materials, it's not so obvious that that would work out. Um, now, at the time we started this project, uh, in about late 2005, early 2006, um, uh, and posted this problem on a website, a blog uh, uh, that we had set up called The Synaptic Leap at the end of 2005. 
Um, and uh, as Cameron just said, it was around the same time that a handful of other people were thinking along the same lines. So Jean-Claude Cameron himself had a, had a lab book on, online. Um, and uh, so we were really feeling the way here because there, there, there weren't really any lab books that we could see that were already online and freely, freely available. Um, and so Jean-Claude was doing some work and, and we posted this problem uh, of what we needed to do online. And then it's just very interesting as, as an experience. Sort of, we sat back then and thought, well, this is now magically going to be a problem that will be solved by the community, um, and uh, that's, that obviously doesn't work either. You, we, we learned quickly you have to provide something for people to get their, their teeth suck into. Um, uh, you can't just expect people to do your work for you. Uh, and so uh, this is, I, I put this as alpha because the, the, the first thing that you need to do in, in terms of an open notebook project is to have something that is available where you can describe the problem and share things with people, and this was very much the alpha because we thought a blog would be sufficient, and it's really not sufficient. Um, it, it allows you to state the problem, but it doesn't have enough functionality. So the beta phase was getting a grant for this thing to get some action going in the lab, uh, and also to, to use a lab notebook, so to, to increase the amount of detail that you're posting a lot. This is where some of these problems of terminology that Peter mentioned come in, I think, is that some people think that if you do a project in a lab which is um, where you blog about what you've done, like, I went in the lab today, and it, you know, it was a nice smell in the air, and I made this molecule, and I went home. Some people think that's open science. It really is not. That's called blogging. Okay? It's not the same thing as an open scientific project. And so having a lab book, I think, is crucial, where you, you are honest about successes and failures and what you've done, including all the raw data. That's what I mean by open science, but it's become a very diluted term. Uh, so this lab book on the bottom here is an open source product itself that came out of the University of Southampton. Um, and it means, so below there, you've got all of, I'll show you, it's, it's a lot easier to show you. Uh, so I don't have the, uh, um, so, is, is that it? No, I can't quite see it. I need to sort of see it on this screen as well, but I can't, so apologies for that. And I can't quite see it. Let me just, let me just click on this instead, because that should be it. All right, so it's going to be a little bit um, screwed up, but that's all right. So this is the lab notebook for open source malaria. The, the screen size is slightly out, sorry about that. But the, it's a live thing, right? So the, there are several lab books, and this, here's one entry. And you see that that's, the, that's from um, yesterday, right? So it's really, you know, it's, it's real time kind of thing. And it has all of the detail here, um, including these machine-readable codes that, that Google will understand as being a molecule. We don't know what that is, but that, that is representative of, of, of a molecule. So it's machine readable and stuff. Um, this is one example of one lab notebook. And there was another one over here I just wanted to show you, which is from lab. Oh, I'm, I'm logged out. That's no good. That's no good. I'll go back to this. Um, and, and here this has been done uh, yesterday. So the detail is bad there. But normally what you'd see is a bunch of pictures and maybe a video and a bunch of detail and then some raw files, which are the, the files that the experimentalist has generated in the lab. So the only thing that's missing there is the molecule itself, which is, of course, stuck in the lab. But all of the data about the process is up there. OK, so it's a, it's a real-time thing. Um, that's what I mean by that. Um, and so that was crucial. And then what happened when we did that was that a lot of people then took the project seriously and started to input you know, into, into, the, into what we were doing uh, and give advice. And that changed the direction of the research. So that's another advantage here of, of being so honest with what you're doing is people can correct your mistakes before you make them. Uh, and that, that is a sel selfishly, from your point of view as a scientist, that's good for you. So it helps to be open because other people can, can correct your mistakes before you waste time on unproductive lines of inquiry. All right. um, and so what that led to was, was, the, was the input of the private sector. So I put this as gamma because this was the most unexpected thing we had is that the majority of the inputs were from the private sector. So companies were advising. And companies did experimental work in the lab which accelerated the research. Um, uh, I, I posted this thing on LinkedIn, which we were all on. For, and we don't understand why we're on it, but we all seem to be on it. But there's, there are groups there of, of, with, with significant expertise. And this was the, one of the groups there really helped solve this problem. And a company did a bunch of work in the lab. So that was also an interesting process because you think, well, why does the company then give away resources for free? Um, a, for free, and B, in an open project where there's no IP. And we, I don't know what the answer to that question is, but I think that it's presumably something to do with the idea that the company can demonstrate how good they are at doing something uh, in a completely free manner and discuss their abilities in a way that they can't normally do. Um, so, the, so the majority of inputs to this project were from, from, from companies. All right. Um, 
And then the delta is the fact that you can then publish it, right? So the, um, all of the, the technical stuff uh, about solving this problem, so the, pro this pro the problem is solved by the top line there. And the bottom line is what a, a, a company that was competing with us did at the same time. So the top is what we did, and the bottom is a company. Um, and so the, the details of the chemistry published in this paper, the PLOS NTD paper, um, which is an open access paper. And there are links. If you go to that, it, the screen size is wrong. Otherwise, I could show you. But if you go to the paper, you'll see there's a bunch of uh, you know, statements, which is what you do in a paper. And then there's a reference. And the reference links to back to the original lab book page. So you can see the justification for the statement in terms of the raw data. Now, the paper is archived, and the supporting information is archived in PLOS, which is, of course, a stable platform. The links to the lab book, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know about the longevity. If I come to this in a 1,000 years, I don't know, I don't know if it's going to be there. Right? So there was an issue there in terms of longevity of the links between the paper and the lab notebook, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, and then because the project was unusual, we, pu we published that separately as a descriptive thing. So the question then is, uh, for us, was whether you could then do that, a slightly more ambitious project where you try and do drug discovery, where you're talking about new molecules, where you'd normally um, expect to need a patent. Right? So that's what open source malaria is all about. You start with um, public domain compounds and try and make drugs out of those, uh, which is what drug discovery is. Uh, and as Cameron mentioned, uh, Jean-Claude was active in this. this. One of the original inspirations for his work was to try and find drugs for malaria that would be straightforward to synthesize. So as, as Cameron said, they would crash out of solutions so that they could be made perhaps in an endemic environment or people could play with them uh, or, or they'd be easy to make on a large scale. So that was some of that work. And, and he, uh, he, did, he, went to, he closed the loop, as he said. He closed the loop of, of, make, of ha having mo molecules identified with free tools on the web, making the molecule, testing it, and seeing activity. It was low activity, but it was activity. So he closed the cycle there and published that in a preceding paper that's shown there, uh, which you'll find if you Google the relevant terms. Um, the, the starting point for this, which was 2010 for us, uh, for the starting point for this project, was this amazing paper from Glaxo that came out in Nature, where they, they screened their entire library against, uh, this is Glaxo, they screened the entire library against uh, the malaria parasite, the parasite living inside red blood cells, so it's a realistic model of what malaria is. And they, from the two million compounds they screened, massive resources, they found um, a bunch of compounds which were very potent for malaria. They cut that back to 13,000 molecules that were really promising as starting points for malaria drug discovery. And they didn't uh, sit on that. They just dumped it in the public domain. Absolutely astonishing paper uh, in 2010. Um, and uh, that has transformed drug discovery in this field to a large extent because it's an embarrassment of riches. There's just so much stuff to look at now uh, in terms of small molecules, easy to make, that are potent. So we started there. We started with those three series. Um, and from the first project, formulated six laws on day one that would govern the way OSM worked. Uh, and these are they. So these are kind of uh, codes of conduct laws. They're not the Pantheon principles, which are important about data, for example. These are meant to be about how you should operate if you want to be part of the project. You, you don't have to do this, work in this way. But if you don't do this, you, you can't be associated with the project because you're not fulfilling the, the criteria. Uh, and could have been, I guess, in decreasing order of importance, the data and ideas being open is, is crucial. Um, and that anyone can take part is crucial. The patents thing is just necessary because uh, unless you know of some way where you can disclose you know, what you've done in the lab and then patent it after that, uh, I'm, I'm all ears. But uh, I, I think that that screws up the, the patent process. Um, and then other, other things about, about how to conduct yourself. Um, so th those are the principles at the start. And I think it's important to define those principles to avoid this kind of terminology creep about what you mean by an open project. You know, how, how open does it have to be um, for people to be part of it? Anyway, some technical detail about the series. Um, and so it's, it's a drug discovery project. But I won't talk about the, the series so far. The, the first three have been from Glaxo. And then this number four on the right is another project, which is what we're currently doing. And that is a compound that originally came from Pfizer. So again, the big inputs from the pharmaceutical industry to, to help this project on. So these are the, the various components, some of which I've just mentioned. Um, but as time has gone on, you know, we realized that a, a blog or a single platform is, is just not enough. Um, we haven't built anything. We've used tools that others have built or that are freely available. Um, but really, it's, it's not the case that you should expect there to be one place where you can do this project. There's, there's no such platform at the moment. And of course, everyone has their own special preferences about how to do things. And so it was right. we never really wanted to build a platform where you could do open science because people you know, wouldn't like various parts of it. So lab books are important. Data management is taken care of by some of the things that we heard about this morning. 
uh, like the Campbell database, which is an openly available repository of, bio of molecules with biological activities. It's a fantastic resource. Um, uh, social media is taking care of the alerts that you need. I mean, there's no better way of, of disseminating a new result than by Twitter or Facebook or something. And the audience is really huge. Um, they're not, you know, ri scientifically rigorous. And as soon as, you know, academic colleagues see that you're posting results on Facebook, they sort of think it's a joke. But uh, it's a great way of getting in touch with people extremely fast. You know, we think, we think nothing of liking a photo that someone posts to the other side of the world within seconds. And yet when we do that with science, somehow that's not acceptable behavior. It's amazing. Um, online meetings, so meetings that ha have to have human interaction, they are usually recorded and placed on YouTube so people can see where you're going to be in the next few months. Again, you know, YouTube makes that very straightforward uh, and, and, and inexpensive. Um, and the, the last thing is in the top right, this, um, the use of GitHub. Uh, now, we don't do software. This is, this is experimental science. We don't, use soft, uh, we don't do coding. But uh, GitHub has this amazing um, issues tracker, which I, if it's in the right window, I can just... I can show you, but oh, it's not really. Sorry, it's just the screen resolution's a little bit out. I was going to show you this thing. The what? The green. Oh, that. Uh huh. Thank you. See, it's the valley of the crab. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, let me just give you the activity. Uh, so this is the. These are the links to the. Um, the GitHub page. So they, we don't, as I said, we don't do any uh, coding, but it has this amazing thing of, of, of having issue, the issue tracker. It's like a to-do list. It's, it's essentially a to-do list in the public domain. And we, we uh, quite early on got lost in this project because we needed a list of what needed to be done and who was going to do it. Um, and we, we tried using wikis and, and I don't know, email lists, and none of it worked. But this thing, someone then suggested we use this thing. And it's fantastic because you can post something and assign people and discuss and tag um, and it really is tremendously useful um, resource. So here's, for example, one of my students in Sydney is, is trying to make a certain molecule, this thing, which, which hasn't been made before um, and needs advice. Uh, and, and so she posted that, and someone replied with an alternative suggestion. Um, and then there's me. But then just yesterday, it was a guy who, um, this guy here, uh, is, was a postdoc at Cambridge when I was a postdoc, and he went, we went different directions. He's now working somewhere else in the UK. And it turns out he's been working on these molecules, uh, but hasn't published it yet. He's got a manuscript he's trying to get published on these molecules. But he's worked on the exact same thing, and un ha by chance understands what it is that my student's having a problem with. And it's just that serendipity. It's so valuable, because that's not published work. So we're getting advice from someone who's done the research themselves, but hasn't managed to get it in the public domain yet. And it's a very good suggestion, and now there's a bit of discussion about, about what that is. So that's the value. It's that serendipity of, of ensuring that you're working with the best people. Th probably this guy is the most qualified person in the world to advise on that molecule, um, and he's found that. I don't know how he found it, but he found it just the other day. So that really warms your heart when you see that. Um, and it, it, it warms your selfish heart, too, because you think, well, my research is faster now for that luck that that person has just got involved. Um, all right, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, that's enough. Oh, yeah, the, the, the delta down here again is, is that you can publish, you know, the stuff that you're doing as well. It doesn't, doesn't uh, ruin that. Um, and, you know, the, there are these mechanisms of Twitter. So this is an example where some guy, we posted the wanted thing up there. We, we needed these three molecules, and no one was making them. So we put a wanted sign out, a wanted active or inactive, and this guy in Edinburgh made the molecule. And it's another example where some guy comes along. He's in Scotland, and we're in Sydney, and he comes along and makes it. Because he can share the data, we have no question that he's made the right molecule, right? It's all there. So we don't have to go and meet him. Um, we just look at the data, and then he gets it you know, tested for malaria activity locally in Scotland, and we share the data because we're using the same controls. Again, it's just so inexpensive because you don't have to ship people around. Uh, people can work locally and share the data in that way, which is, which is very nice. Um, and the one last example, I guess, is is this one where, um, so this is one of the molecules up on the top left here that we're looking at now. This series is, is um, it's interesting actually. This series is, um, is active uh, against malaria in mice, which is quite an advanced stage of drug development. Uh, and as far as we know, no one has come along and patented this uh, since we disclosed these molecules. But that, couldn't, that, that might happen, and I don't know what's gonna happen if that happens. But it's, they're fairly promising molecules in the public domain. Um, so we're kind of waiting to see. We're not, we're, we're kind of, we should keep our eye on the patent literature just to see if someone manages to make a case for it. The one disadvantage of these molecules is that they're metabolized quite fast in the bloodstream of the mouse. 
Um, and we don't know why that's, being, that's happening. So if you don't know why it's being metabolized, you can't block the met metabolism. And so, it looks that, so we're looking at the structure, and we didn't know what was doing. So some guy called Chris Swain came along and did some modeling of this, of this structure and said, well, I think it's where these arrows are is likely to be where you're installing your oxygens. Um, and and he, he, the, the consensus was there was this enzyme called aldehyde oxidase, where, which is likely to be doing this, this uh, metabolism. Searched around for who was running this assay, because it's a new assay, and there's a lab at Pfizer in Connecticut that runs this, and it has a specialist working there. And I wrote to him and said, could you run this assay for this project? It's open source. It's the way it works. You'd be named. You know, the, your data would be put in the public domain. Um, and within about six, seven working days, they'd said yes to, being, to, be, to running it and also being named. And there was no paperwork. And I, it's just extraordinary. I've never worked with companies that fast because it's just so straightforward. They understand exactly what's going on. They understand the nature of it. There's no NTAs to sign. It's just a, 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 a glorious way of working where, when the transparency uh, makes it a lot simpler. And, and again, a company helping out, a big company helping out because it's seen as being in their interest to do that. Uh, all right, the last note about um, that we're starting a, a TB project, uh, very similar in structure. And I just wanted to highlight one thing about the paper. So this is what I wanted to get to about how you, how you can write papers based on this stuff. So we did a little bit of work on TB, uh, and the project's starting now, but we did a little bit of preliminary work on TB. Um, a student in my lab called Kat, uh, who's the first author on this paper, which has been submitted. It's, it's, um, it's, it's nearly through the peer review process, this paper. Um, and, uh, and so you, you write up the results in a paper, and the paper is important as a story to bring people up to speed and also as a, as a, you know, a permanent record of a project without all the detail. I, I think it's, it's, the papers still have a value. Um, so the paper is, is the regular document with a bunch of stuff at the end and the references and, the, and some of the data. And then, of course, you can submit all the other important data that you think is important as supporting information, which is what we all do. And often those are impeded, so that's a PDF thing in the middle, so that humans can, humans can read this stuff and check that your data is okay. And that still also has value, um, I think. Um, but then, of course, you know, what you don't want to do is, is stop there. So a lot of chemists will say, well, that's where, that means you're sharing data. You know, you're sharing pictures of your data, and you're being generous with your data. That's enough, isn't it? Well, no, it's not, obviously, enough, because you want to share the raw data in this day and age. Why not share the raw data? So in this paper, we've also, all of the, the data that you see as pictures in the paper are also the raw data. And typically, in chemistry, that doesn't happen. You don't share the raw data files for a lot of things. And I was going to show you how to navigate around that, but it's 300 megabytes, and I'm not sure the connection here will, is going to be happy if I download that. But it's, that's part of the submission process. But then you, you can imagine something more, and this is what we tried to do with this paper. And I, it's not been accepted yet, but... Um, but um, Hopefully, when it, when it is uh, accepted, then, then uh, this will make a nice story. In addition to that, we took the lab notebook, which is this lab trove lab notebook, which has everything in it. So that's including all the failures, all the pictures, if there's videos that are there as well, um, and all the data sets which are embedded and dated, the whole thing, <laughs> right, which is about eight months' work. And you can, uh, you can make, this is very forward thinking of lab trove, you can make an offline snapshot of that. So you take it off the web, and you make a, you, you make a, a sort of permanent record of it, which you can't change, but it retains all its features. So, um, so, so you can download an object and then upload it to a repository, which is where it is. So this is actually, it's funny, this is publicly available before the paper's been accepted. <laughs> I'm not sure you're supposed to do that, but it, so you can download this, and you download the zip file. Again, it's a few hundred megabytes. It's fairly big. But then you unzip it, and, um, and you can walk, or you can navigate around it, because all the links are active. So you can go to the first experiment and then navigate to the second one and, and go between the experiments. So it's all that. Now, of course, no one's ever going to read that. But if you wanted to go to the raw data or if you wanted a machine to read it, then you can do that. So I, I don't see why we don't just always do that. <laughs> why don't you just, so you, you should do some work, record everything in the lab book, distill your paper out, and then submit the data and the lab book as supporting information. It's just so simple. It's so simple. Um, so I'm hoping that this will show that it's simple and that people could do this. Um, uh, you have to use an electronic lab notebook. You have to be happy that you know people can see if you spill something or if you cock something up. But um, but if you're happy with those things, then that's uh, it's a, it's an efficient way of sharing the lot. Uh, just as a last point on on this, before I, I talk about one more thing for the last two minutes, but the last thing one that I mentioned with regards Jean Claude was uh, was way back then we we were thinking about the same thing about five years ago about whether if you do open projects, who will publish this work? You know, so if you if you disclose everything, who's going to publish it? Um, in chemistry, this is a big thing because the big publishers of chemistry will not publish this work if it's already in the public domain. The American Chemical Society won't, won't touch it. 
So we, we started this, uh, this, this letter here about sending it to journals, about asking them to clarify if they would publish open research. And uh, it never got sent out because I think basically things started to clarify. The journalists sort of caught up and, 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 and would, would be clearer about whether they were going to pu publish open research. But, um, so hopefully I think this is a kind of a non-issue now that many, many uh, publishers will take things which are already in the public domain. But back, five, you know, five, ten years ago, it was not as, not as clear as it is today. All right, last thing I was going to mention was the application of this going, going forward. So in the last few uh, weeks, we've heard these dreadful stories about Ebola. Um, and a few people have started asking the question about why don't, you, why don't we have any drugs for Ebola? You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and there are lots of answers to that, but, but it's, a, it's a good question to ask, whether it's an economic thing or a scientific thing or, or what. Um, and so this is... Uh, uh, we, a, a few, me and a few other people have started asking about whether you could do the whole of the drug discovery process from day one through to marketing uh, in an open way. And it's not that obvious. The discovery phase, which is what we're doing, is obvious. But it's obvious that open, openness would help. Um, and right at the end, it feels like it's obvious that openness would help in terms of making it cheaply and distributing it cheaply and having low-priced uh, drugs. But it's the clinical stuff, uh, whether it's IP-heavy, that it's a bit less obvious. Um, uh, so remember that diagram. I'm going to come back to it. This is the classic Chevron diagram of drug discovery. Um, so we, there was this conference in July about whether you could extend this idea to the whole of pharma. Um, so whether you could imagine doing the whole composite process of drug discovery with no secrets. And, um, and that was an interesting few days to talk through that. The, the outcome of it was, um, there's a website if you want to visit it, the outcome of that was the idea that rather than thinking about that Chevron structure, monolithic thing that you start and invest in year one and spend a huge amount of money with incredible risk to try and get something out at the end, that you smash the process up into a tile-based thing and you, you install various bits at various points. So no one agency is responsible for the whole thing. And it makes you think a lot about the way in which you solve big, complex problems, that if everything is open and you run a project for a year and you get stuck somewhere, if everyone knows what the problem is, then people are at liberty to come in and fund those issues to try and get over those bits. And then you get over the next bit, and then you say, well, now we're up here, and this is looking really good. Who wants to fund another year of this project? So long as it's completely open, you can do that. So we're kind of excited about this idea of, of maybe plotting out a slightly different way of doing things with solutions at every stage. And people are, are quite positive about this idea that you could, you could do drug discovery in a, with, with a different model. Again, being completely open about everything. There was just a letter in the Washington Post today about, about whether um, the, the usual structures of drug discovery are ever going to give us drugs for Ebola. So it's quite topical, this stuff. Uh, last thing, which is something that a couple of you have heard, is, is just the effect on, um, on openness on, in terms of the, the students taking part and the people watching, the public. Um, I don't know about, about whether you have family members or friends who are not scientists who uh, don't feel connected to, to the process of research. It's, it's something that happens behind the, the closed walls of academia, and people don't really understand what it is, uh, where drugs come from, or how scientific advances are made. And I understand that completely. Um, it can feel very, uh, uh, you can feel very disillusioned trying to understand what science is. So the, the analogy I, I, I've used before is that, uh, for me, the exciting thing about watching a process is being able to watch the whole thing, not just the end of it. And the, the analogy is, for me, one of the most exciting things is, is the 100-meter sprint at the Olympics, or, or a football match. I guess that's, that's more appropriate here, right? <clears throat> um, so that's the analogy of a football match. It's better. Um, so it, you know, the, the excitement of, a, of going to a football match is not that you go to the stadium and then you sit in the bar for 90 minutes, and then you walk in and see what the score is at the end. Right? You sit through the whole match. Right? That's why it's exciting. Um, it's same with the sprint. You, you want to watch the whole 10 seconds, and that's what's exciting about it. Um, if you just close it off, like if you ran the 100-meter sprint in tunnels and somebody shot a gun and then 10 seconds later some guy popped out at the other end, it, no one would watch that. That's a stupid race, right? So it, the point about it is that it's exciting because you see the process. So I think in terms of getting people, the public involved in science, they've got to see the process, right? They've got to, they can't just see the fact that a drug comes out 10 years later for Ebola. They, I think people need to re-engage with what it means and to demystify the process of science. And I think openness, besides making the whole process more efficient, which is what we've all been talking about, and everyone agrees, right? That, that, that would also help engage the public with what it is, what science actually is. Um, and I, I would find that very valuable, indeed. Some people who've, who've uh, helped with the project. It's very difficult to give this slide because you, there are some people who help anonymously, so you just you thank them uh, anonymously. All right, um, thank you for the chance to talk today. <laughs> Thank you.
A gente estava falando um pouco, é, o Peter acabou adiantando um pouco, trazendo um pouco já o assunto de Open Notebook Science de manhã. E, então, a gente pensou em fazer uma coisa um pouco mais curta é, na minha apresentação. Eu acho que já teve bastante discussão em cima do tema e de exemplos legais. E eu vou acabar apresentando um pouco rapidamente assim algumas algumas iniciativas brasileiras que se aproximam disso e de referências que a gente pode ir atrás para quem tiver interesse em, 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 em digamos, praticar ou colocar isso em prática né, por aqui, com quem pode conversar. E claro que sempre hoje em dia você pode conversar com pessoas de qualquer lugar do mundo, mas às vezes é legal ter alguma ideia de, 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 de que espaços isso já ocupou aqui uh, no Brasil. Uh, eu devia usar uma tela só, né? fica mais fácil. Então, pera. Uh... Não. Mirror. Bom, é, falar rapidamente então de algumas, algumas, é, algumas pessoas que andaram buscando entender essa prática e as vantagens que ela tem, um pouco da minha experiência pessoal também, por isso que acabei entrando nessa, nessa mesa. É, em primeiro lugar, acho que se, se existe alguma, se teve algum começo essas discussões sobre como praticar a ciência de forma mais... É, contemplando um pouco mais as possibilidades que se abriram é, com as redes de comunicação e digital no Brasil. Isso foi por bastante influência de um professor chamado Imre Simon. É, o professor Imre, bem, recentemente, faz uns cinco anos atrás, é, veio a falecer, mas ele já tinha passado o seu, seu, seu bom tempo aqui nesse, nesse universo. É, e ele... Dentre várias, muitas outras coisas, e dentre elas introduziu o software livre no Brasil, uma das pessoas que introduziu o software livre no Brasil, é, e de ter trazido também, ter sido um dos responsáveis de trazer as ideias, a gente viu mais de uma apresentação ao longo desse congresso, uh, a referência do livro do Johai Benkler, né? o professor Imi foi uma das primeiras pessoas a trazer a discussão dele para o Brasil e tal, trouxe ele para um evento e, e outras coisas assim. É, ele também foi um, uma pessoa que liderou um projeto dentro da... chamava Uma parte de um projeto que chamava Tidia, que envolvia a produção de uma plataforma para que pesquisadores pudessem colocar sua pesquisa online, colocar, organizar grupos de pesquisa online e ter mais facilidade em produzir é, softwares para pesquisa e compartilhados. Né? Essa plataforma chamava-se Incubadora Virtual, da FAPESP. É, Dia, ela chegou a ter mais de 100 projetos, isso aqui é um, é, um, é, um, é um screenshot de como ela existiu, é uma captura histórica aí pela Wayback Machine de como ela estava em, na, em 2008. É, e acho que talvez um dos primeiros exemplos aí que... É, agora, a, a Anne, que está ali, que já foi citada no começo pelo Peter, né? ela está agora começando a estudar esse assunto como parte da... especificamente o assunto de Open Notebook Science, e um, um, talvez o primeiro exemplo que ela identificou e teve a sua qualificação recentemente foi o exemplo do Xamã. E aí a gente está falando de uma coisa que não é exatamente Open Notebook Science, como acabou de ser definido, pelo como era dito assim estritamente pelo Jean-Claude e todas essas questões de, da imediatismo e tal, mas, uh, mas com essa, esse, esse espírito de produzir pesquisa de maneira aberta para o público, de maneira é, conjunta com o público, com quem tivesse interessado em colaborar, é, seja acadêmico ou não. É, infelizmente, a incubadora acabou saindo do ar por questões aí da, do, do, do tempo de, de financiamento, ela era financiada por um grant, acho que a gente já ouviu essa história hoje, o grant acabou e acabou, acabou que a, plata, a plataforma em si saiu do ar, muitos dos projetos conseguiram migrar para outros espaços. Uh, a foto daquela época do, do Xamã, que é o projeto de doutorado do Henrique, que a gente escutou falar, o, falar durante o seminário também, está sem o CSS, então aparece só o texto, não aparece o, o, o design, que era muito bacana. E foi talvez, talvez assim, 
cronologicamente, um dos primeiros projetos que teve essa, usando essa, essa infraestrutura que o professor Imri ajudou a criar, é, teve essa intenção e essa ideia de trabalhar cooperativamente. Eu não sei se o Henrique gostaria de falar alguma coisa de como foi a experiência, aproveitando que nós estamos aqui, né? Depois. Então, a gente vai seguir para um debate, a gente pode depois... E aí eu vou falar um pouco mais do meu... minha tentativa de fazer isso também, até antes, independentemente aí, mas engraçado que a gente fosse encontrar depois. Então, em 2009, eu comecei a trabalhar num projeto. Eu não conhecia essa, essas discussões, mas estava muito envolvido no movimento Wikimedia e e em outros espaços de produção colaborativa, muito software livre. E eu vou dizer até, provavelmente esses não são os... os eu diria que talvez não sejam os exemplos zero, certamente alguns projetos e algumas teses uh, na área de, que envolviam software livre já publicavam seus softwares em tempo, em tempo real e já compartilhavam seus softwares, já tinha alguma movimentação nesse sentido. Mas em termos de registrar o trabalho do processo, pelo menos são exemplos... Uh, uh, que já tem algum tempinho aí, não sei se... É, ninguém está querendo dizer que é primeiro nem nada. Uh, e falar um pouco da experiência, do que foi útil, de como funciona isso um pouco. Então, eu, é, a gente começou usando... Eu comecei a trabalhar num projeto e eu vou dizer que veio um pouco até de necessidade esse, essa ideia de trabalhar de maneira mais aberta. Porque o meu grupo estava em São Paulo, Minas Gerais, é, Princeton e, e Rio de Janeiro. Então, era um grupo de pesquisa totalmente deslocalizado e, com isso, a gente precisava, de alguma maneira, para colaborar de forma mais eficiente. E, como eu vinha dessa, desse, desse mundo da Wiki, aí eu falei, ah, bom, por que não colocar tudo online e a gente vai ficar muito mais fácil para a gente colaborar e nada do que a gente está fazendo é segredo ou a gente não tem a menor, nenhum de nós tem a intenção de tornar isso secreto, nem nada. É, e aí, para minha surpresa, o resto do grupo topou. É, mas não tanta surpresa, porque eles eram pessoas bacanas, né? E se não, estaria trabalhando com eles, talvez. E a gente começou a registrar o nosso trabalho aqui, e era um trabalho para o governo federal, é, é, e para UNAIDS, alguma coisa assim, é, sobre é, estudo de um novo método para avaliar o tamanho de populações suscetíveis a doenças infecciosas, em particular o HIV, né? Uh, algumas das e bom uh, então a gente criou essa página na wiki ao mesmo tempo a incubadora havia sido desfeita né o planetário que é onde o Henrique havia desenvolvido o projeto dele mas no meio desse tempo a USP criou um projeto chamado Stoa que era um projeto que envolvia uma combinação de Moodle rede social e wiki para que os pesquisadores pudessem colaborar e, 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 e divulgar sua pesquisa e, e colaborar entre si com outras pessoas Uh, então, eu adotei a Wiki do Stoa como um espaço de começar essa organização. Uh, e a gente começou a organizar, por exemplo, aqui são as instruções de uma das, um dos procedimentos da pesquisa, que era um jogo uh, que a gente realizava com usuários de drogas para ver se eles, para eles conseguirem, para reconstruir a rede social deles e as relações deles, as relações de confiança na rede social com respeito à sexualidade e ao uso de de droga, e ao uso das drogas, enfim, a troca de agulhas, enfim, quem sabia que eles eram usuários. É, aqui já é um exemplo, né? essa pessoa sendo entrevistada não, não é um usuário de droga, sou eu. <risos> <risos> com apesar de todas as parentes, <risos> num outro momento aí da vida, né? o doutorado não faz com você. E, <risos> e, e aqui estão descritos todos os procedimentos, as ideias que a gente tinha de como construir o questionário, era um questionário que tinha que ser adaptado a um método estatístico, então a forma específica como as perguntas eram construídas tinha que refletir as preocupações desse método. Uh, e, e é muito comum que você ter questionários e você ter em amostragem em estatística, você ter esses problemas, e todo e você, muitos momentos, você publica o questionário, quando quando muito, né, você publica o questionário completo de como as pessoas são entrevistadas, uh, de onde saíram os dados brutos e tal. Raramente você tem acesso, e essa foi uma questão que a gente descobriu que depois, depois não, mas que a gente sentiu muito depois, raramente você tem acesso a, ao raciocínio por trás das decisões de, é, dos instrumentos que foram utilizados, as decisões estratégicas, as decisões é, de consistência científica de, por trás dos instrumentos. Uh, então, 
a, e a gente come, nesse registro todo a gente pode é, oferecer isso e dar um detalhe bem é, tentando dar o maior detalhe possível de como a gente pensou em realizar essas coisas onde estavam os algoritmos para escolhas de certas coisas enfim uma espécie de nessa bem nesse sentido de tentar registrar um, a maior em maior profundidade possível o, o processo de, de pesquisa né e talvez seja interessante porque esses dois casos são interessantes porque já são casos que saem um pouco da, da hard science né aqui é, é um passado de pública digamos assim, pesquisa em saúde pública no caso do Henrique é sociologia educação é educação é visual pesquisa visual é... e é uma coisa interessante Uh, deixa eu ver se eu vou conseguir achar aqui. Bom, a gente tinha as tarefas detalhadas na Wiki, né, para quem precisava, meio que parecido com o, o Bug Tracker lá, só que uma versão um pouco mais pedestre. Uh, e se eu achar aqui, aqui, o questionário. Acho uma coisa muito interessante é justamente olhar o, o questionário que foi produzido né, nessa primeira pesquisa. E é um questionário bastante extenso e tal, até. Bom, nem tanto. Mas o legal é que a gente tem, anexo esse questionário, a página de discussão do questionário. E acho que essa foi uma coisa que fez, que, que representa uma, 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 uma mudança bastante radical, assim, dentro desse, desse meio de pesquisa, porque a gente tem o registro de meses e meses de discussão sobre cada uma das perguntas do questionário, por que, que a gente colocou esse pronome e não aquele, por que, que a gente escolheu essa palavra e não aquela, em termos de como a gente achava que um usuário de droga ia pensar em responder aquela pergunta. E esse é um trabalho que, assim, essencialmente, nessa área, é replicado em toda vez que uma pesquisa nova começa. As pessoas têm que... Ou elas pegam um questionário que já está pronto e confiam cegamente naquilo, ou elas têm que refazer esse trabalho, repensar, e muitas vezes vão pegar aspectos que não foram pegos antes e vice-versa. Então, é, ter esse registro para quem for tentar fazer uma outra pesquisa semelhante no futuro é uma coisa riquíssima. E a gente pode viver isso em primeira mão porque, é, alguns anos depois, a gente foi refazer a pesquisa num outro âmbito. É, então, nesse período, é, teve alguns problemas na plataforma Estou, ela ficou mais ou menos, depois ela voltou a ser um pouco mais atualizada, mas já teve um período em que ela ficou um pouco abandonada, especialmente a Wiki. E aí eu acabei começando a participar de um outro espaço, que era a Wikiversidade, e aí acho que é uma coisa interessante sobre o que foi falado aí pelo método de o quanto, o quanto a gente pode confiar que são perenes esses cadernos, né? então é uma coisa que eu tenho considerado bastante importante, é usar plataformas que a gente sabe que tem base em, algum, em alguma estrutura mais sólida, é, e que tem alguém que, que, que responsável por manter aquilo funcionando, ao mesmo tempo que tenha, que seja aberto e parte de um espaço colaborativo. Né? Então, a Wikiversidade é mantida pela Wikimedia Foundation, a mesma organização que mantém a Wikipédia, e, portanto, ela existe dentro de uma governança, não, vai, não dá para dizer democrática, mas bastante aberta e, e, e bem mais aberta que outras organizações que a gente conhece por aí, tem uma série de problemas, como qualquer organização, mas... É, e que é mantida fundamentalmente por pequenas doações de milhões de pessoas. Então, acho que esse é um, esse é um fator muito bacana de sustentabilidade desse projeto, né? e que tem bastante a ver com essa questão de, de ser aberto, de envolvente, de colaborativo, e está dentro desse, dessa perspectiva maior mesmo de trabalhar é, a ciência, o conhecimento como uma atividade massificada, uma atividade de todos. Né? É, Uh, essa é a minha página pessoal na universidade e aí um dos projetos que tem aqui ops, é o inquérito Crack Brasil, que eu já deixei aberto aqui, que foi uma repetição daquele método no, no âmbito nacional. E aí a gente teve que refazer vários questionários e vários outros, mas foi uma coisa muito boa que a gente tinha um registro para nós mesmos, porque muitas daquelas discussões, se a gente tivesse tido por e-mail ou, ou por, por outros, me, outros meios, por telefone, Skype, que fosse, e não registrados numa wiki, a gente não teria conseguido resgatar porque que a gente tomou uma série de decisões com relação dentro do questionário, a gente teria esquecido, a gente esqueceu, e foi super bom ter de volta o que a gente tinha feito é, registrado naquele outro espaço. Né? Então, foi, enfim, e essa foi a segunda pesquisa que a gente realizou mais ou menos, é mais ou menos o mesmo grupo, né? aqui estão já alguns nomes, é que a gente, uma vantagem também é que, um dos, ah, um dos problemas, que, as vezes que a gente acabou saindo do Estou é que 
a, nessa época, o Wiki da USP só aceitava que os membros da universidade tivessem cadastro. Então, quem não tinha cadastro tinha que editar anônimo. Mas você olha aqui no histórico, é, você vai ver o meu nome várias vezes e um monte de IPs editando. Então, aqui são os meus colegas todos fora, da, que não eram membros da universidade, e aqui só quando eu edito eu tenho o meu nome. Só que a gente não conseguia saber quem estava editando. Mesmo assim, a coisa funcionou muito bem. Então, acho que vai um pouco nesse sentido do nesse sentido de desafio do, do que o próprio John Cole colocava. De, o que tiver pela frente, não se deixa limitar pela inadequação, pela aparente inadequação, inadequação das coisas. Sempre dá para fazer, fazer muito mais do que a gente imagina, é, mesmo quando as coisas não parecem moldadas especificamente para nossa finalidade. Né? Tem ferramentas aí, vamos usar elas de forma criativa, né? Uh, eu não poderia mostrar os outros exemplos, como vocês podem ver, se vocês quiserem, depois esse é o endereço da minha página, se quiserem abrir, tem basicamente todos os meus trabalhos de pesquisa e colaborações aí registrados de alguma forma, apresentações que eu fiz em alguns outros lugares, enfim, é, dentro dessa wiki. Uh, tá, eu não vou entrar em detalhes aqui, mas tem a biografia aí, então a ideia era realmente... É, o calendário, que seria nosso nosso bug tracker, mas meio tosco. É, ok. E aí você tem o mesmo processo. Dentro de cada um você tem a discussão do, do, do que foi feito. Esse trabalho ainda está sendo processado lá internamente em Brasília, então a gente não sabe ainda quando vai conseguir publicá-lo. É, mas, enfim, você tem todas as discussões. Bom, é misturado português com inglês. Enfim. O uh, que mais temos aqui? Ah, isso aqui. Bom, e agora, uh, acho que são alguns exemplos de como isso pode ser interessante, como isso, pode ser, como isso tem aplicações mais amplas também uh, do que as áreas das ciências mais duras. Acho que tem muita riqueza e acho que aí o Henrique vai poder falar depois também. Uh, até, inclusive, porque dentro do que a Anne estava mapeando, ela encontrou uma, uma aluna de... Uh, de... Letras e artes cênicas na UFBA, né? UFBA? que está fazendo um open no uma wiki também com open notebook uh, no wiki spaces ela tem tido alguma tá, eu fui olhar aqui as atividades recentes dela ela editou uma vez umas duas vezes esse mês em julho um pouco mais tá aí também algum colocando coisas é, fazendo seu registro aí e acho que é um desafio interessante e necessário aí pensar em como fazer todas essas coisas. Uh, a gente precisa, fazendo uma última um último, é, um último observação sobre o que a gente tem dentro do grupo de trabalho de ciência aberta, a gente tem tentado mapear um pouco quem tem adotado essas práticas para que as pessoas possam se ajudar entre si. Uh, esse mapeamento precisa ser enriquecido, atualizado. Aqui, por exemplo, a gente precisa, a gente precisa colocar esses novos casos que a gente achou aí. Uh, Wiki Pesquisas é como eu estava chamando o caderno de pesquisa aberto. Agora que eu sei o nome certo, eu posso, depois a gente precisa mudar isso aqui. Muito bem, acho que diretamente dentro disso, acho que já concluí. A gente queria realmente deixar espaço para uma conversa mais interessante daqui a pouco. Mais aqui. Se alguém já quisesse levantar braço para fazer questões... Não, eu posso começar logo, para esquentando. É... Bom, então vou começar só para esquentar, fazer uma primeira pergunta, mas antes de vocês responderem, eu vejo se ainda tem mais alguém para, para essa primeira rodada. Né? É... A gente vê que esses projetos eles envolvem diferentes níveis né, de, de colaboração entre pessoas, entre indivíduos, né? entre grupos de pesquisa, entre instituições é, públicas, entre instituições públicas de pesquisa, ensino e empresas, é, às vezes no mesmo país, às vezes entre países. Né? E a minha pergunta é em relação à governança disso. Né? Como é que, é, pela experiência de vocês, né, como é que tem sido a governança, que, quer dizer, que desafios, é, se, se há desafios né, na governança da, desse tipo de colaboração, e, inclusive, em termos, eventualmente, de... Ou, se é tudo pode acontecer no nível da informalidade, da, da, da colaboração peer-to-peer, informal, né? 
ou se é, isso é, envolve também, por exemplo, na relação entre empresas ou entre grupos, entre países, algum nível de formalização em termos de acordos e se isso é ou não uma barreira para esse tipo de colaboração. Né? Então, não sei quem quer começar. Ah, espera, desculpe, tem mais alguém querendo fazer alguma pergunta? O... Renier. Alexandre, ah, normalmente no, o Todd apresentou um, uh, um trabalho que era em colaboração com outras áreas acadêmicas e privadas. No seu caso, tinha o, envolvido, de certa forma, uma entidade pública. Então, a, poderia falar mais sobre se o pessoal do setor público se envolveu com a sua pesquisa, participou ou não? Quer, quer perguntar? Ou é só estar se espreguiçando? Não, ele quer perguntar. A gente faz essas três primeiras, para vocês não ficarem com muitas perguntas, depois a gente abre. É, eu queria perguntar sobre a questão do, do, do caderno de laboratório físico. É, eu já conhecia antes caderno de laboratórios é, colaborativos, abertos na internet e tudo mais. É, e eu já propus para professores meus usarem e começarem a adotar esse tipo de coisa. É, a utilização desse tipo de, de, de caderno de laboratório elimina o, o, o caderno de laboratório físico? Pode eliminar ou não deve eliminar? Ok. É isso. Então, Matt. Uh, just on that last, on that last question. Um, Uh, the what one of the advantages of um, of going open is that people can work uh, on the problem anywhere and be full members and participate. So on one of the malaria series, there's um, there was an undergraduate lab class in uh, in a little college in the Midwest of the U.S. near Michigan, and they about 50 of these guys made some molecules for the malaria project. And they're, they're now being evaluated for whether they're good, at, they're, they're potent or not. Um, and they're able to do that. So they, they, they work in their own lab using their own system. Uh, and there's just this requirement that they, they share the data, you know, and that they understand what the project is. And that's one of the most exciting things about this, is that you can imagine working in line with what you do locally. So maybe you're a PhD student or an undergrad or whatever. But you can work in your own lab and, and do your own things, but then you're, you're a full member of this. Because you're not a member because you paid something. You're a member because of what you're doing. Right? It's, a, it's a code of conduct. Um, and that, to me, is just extremely efficient because you don't have to worry about airplane tickets. You don't have to worry about paying fees. You're just working and sharing what's important. So uh, it, it, doesn't, it means you, you still need a lab in order to make stuff for the project. If it's experimental, you need a lab. Like if you're doing code, you need a computer. Um, but it, it does reduce the costs a lot because you're not shifting humans around the planet, which is always expensive. Um, can I just I, do you want to? Can I just ask, answer the thing about governance? Yeah. If, uh, is that all right? So the because that's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, the uh, as we get more open, because I think everyone here is going to do open projects, right? So as they get more common and bigger, the governance thing is going to become even more important because you don't want chaos. Um, and I think, so Peter mentioned something about this before, that um, you, you've just got to be so clear about your operating principles, and that's what, that's what defines everything. So if you can be clear about what it is you're doing, the rules, um, then that, that means that people from lots of places can, can take part. It doesn't matter who you are, so long as you adhere to the rules about being transparent and open and allowing reuse, and this is what licensing is all about. So... Um, I've had to explain to uh, companies very carefully what this means. Because, of course, a lot of people think that open, open means it's open access, so you can read it in a journal. People don't understand that there's other part, kinds of open where you can actually get involved. So that requ requires careful explanation and lots of emails. But um, once it's explained, um, often it's the private sector that are the most enthusiastic. They just think, wow, this is exactly what... If we didn't have to worry about making money, You know, this is what we do because we're just scientists and we love this stuff. So, so I think it, after you explain it um, uh, to people carefully and you are clear about the rules and the licenses, then people can participate um, uh, from diverse from diverse backgrounds. 
the, there's the added question about whether they're doing it as individuals or as, as a member of a company. And it's always great when someone uh, contributes with their company behind them because then that gives greater sanction. And it br they bring their reputation with them, which is really great, uh, their professional reputation. But it's not essential if it's a problem. It's, for me, it's not essential. You can be individuals just doing things in the evenings. You know? um, but I think it's a really interesting question. And, and, and the organization of this, of, of lots of different people, uh, requires a lot of careful time and uh, uh, mentorship and, and, and supporting the structure and, and recognizing contributions that are freely given. Um, and writing things up so people are rewarded with papers or whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of effort. There's no, it's not free, you know? Apenas uma, just have a question. Apenas uma pergunta. É, mas isso normalmente isso ocorre no nível informal ou, você, ou é necessário, em alguns casos, assinar alguma coisa, firmar um acordo? Ou, 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 isso se resolve na... Não, as regras, tudo bem, mas é basta a troca de e-mails ou é preciso algo, normalmente, em alguns casos, vocês precisam chegar a esse ponto de... Right. Yeah, no, again, it's really interesting. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but we have, uh, there's two, two principles there. One is that you, you, know, you, you clearly explain in written form, like an email, what is involved. And the second thing is you assume no asshole behavior. Right, it's the no asshole rule. So you, you you explain things in an email clearly, and if someone wants to to be an idiot, then they can still do that. But you assume that people don't don't behave in that way. And th those two are, they're fairly powerful. You know, you you think the best of people, <laughs> and you and you try and reduce the the paperwork. One of the advantages of that is that if there's no contract, um, people can do a, a piece of work, um, and then leave. All right, and there's, there's no obligation to be part of it. So you don't end up having meetings of 20 people where 18 people don't want to be there. You, know? it, it could, you, you can have a little contribution and then walk away. And that, I think a lot of companies like that in particular. If it goes wrong, um, if, if, the, if the collaboration goes wrong, they can walk away and, and they know they're not going to get sued for breach of any kind of contract. So that, that's the advantage, I guess. I'll stop. So yeah, I think this, this, this issue of governance is, is critically important, particularly as this becomes more than a few small groups doing something. Um, and I think you know, to echo what Matt said, you know, making the rules of engagement explicit is critical. There is a really interesting dynamic um, that there's been a lot of work done on this in the open source communities, but there is often a necessity for a leader, even if the project um, uh, is one that anyone can take part, part of with and is entirely democratic. There's usually someone who needs to provide the energy um, to, that, that keeps things going. Um, Peter's actually talked about a model of governance, and I don't know whether this makes any sense, but the Doctor Who model um, of leadership. So if, if that, that means nothing to the, to the residents that are in Doctor Who is a television, long-running television show um, in the UK where the main character actually changes. The, the, the person playing the character has changed now 13 oh, times. Yes. And so someone, you know, someone comes in and places, but the notion is that there is a person in the league. And this possibly useful um, analogy that David offers in the book about the Nazi Germany and the Nazi Germany that um, the Nazi Germany that 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 the Nazi Germany away from it, he talks about um, digital residents versus um, uh, residents versus visitors. I think there's a model here of you know, as the projects get bigger, you have people who are resident in the project from the absolute members of that community. And then you have uh, visitors who may come in and then and then go away again. And I think we're going to need to develop rules and, and understanding about how we need to talk about the way probably a more explicit form. Um, come back to this question about the lab notebooks, whether you, I, I heard it in a slightly different way, but so um, yes, you need, you need the physical lab, but do you actually need a physical lab notebook anymore? And um, one of the interesting things, so when we started this, we assumed that we would never be able to take devices into the lab. So it was this notion, this is 2008, 2005, 2006, or maybe a tablet would work, tablets at that time, the old, horrendously expensive thing. You didn't want to take that into the lab. 
Um, obviously, now the world moved on, and do use um, iPads and similar things. He writes a lot. Um, had cheap effect. But one of the things that shifted was the adoption of uh, electronic lab notebooks in pharmaceutical companies on a large scale. And one of the things they discovered is that the smart thing to do is to have a really cheap keyboard and a really cheap monitor and then have a computer outside the room. So you can actually have something where you can throw away the components if they got damaged. Um, and so that notion of having computers in the lab became much more common sort of 2005 through 2010. So it was there. Um, and something else that happened for us, at least in the UK, was that it actually became problematic to take a lab notebook out of the lab. It's a beanie to a biohazard class 2 laboratory, for instance. Technically speaking, you shouldn't take the lab notebook back out of the lab. So being able to record things electronically on the web form is something really, really exciting. So, a computer still can't do the same things with a piece of paper can. You know, it's still got as good pleasant experience as a piece of paper in many ways. Um, but it's got some other advantages. So for me, I stopped using a paper lab in 2007. I've been using Carly Oakland and stuff since then. <laughs> Colaboração no sentido de que as pessoas das entidades públicas é, vieram e, e editaram as páginas, não porque a gente dava de maneira um pouco mais distante do mais, mas elas tiveram acesso e acharam que várias vezes sentido de feedback positivo, de que elas acharam interessante ver tudo, viram e acharam. Achava um bom que tiver né, acesso. Talvez não tenha nem entendido que aquilo estava aberto para qualquer pessoa ler. Né? Isso é uma possibilidade, porque até a cair a ficha é, é um passo grande. Uh, mas não teve nenhum, nenhuma oposição quando teve graça do mundo de então, né? uh, Tinha uma outra coisa que eu ia falar sobre isso. Uh, mas sobre a questão da governança, acho que tem uma coisa, um outro aspecto de governança aqui, ó, governança é, do lado técnico também. Né? E se você pega a Wikipedia, por exemplo, ela tem um processo de governança bastante complexo. E é bem possível que isso faça bem a se desenvolver é, para cima desses espaços de colaboração científica. Né? Porque você pode eventualmente escrever um livro de abertura que você estiver trabalhando, está suscetível ao vandalismo das pessoas que fazem edições. É, maliciosas e outras coisas assim. É, e acho que vai, cada projeto tem que, ser, tem que ter o seu nível de espaço, de, de, de acreditação das pessoas antes de dar permissões para elas. No caso do que eu trabalhei, a gente não tinha nenhum problema em deixar tudo aberto. Vai também nas condições da pessoa entender como fazer esse monitoramento e de ver. E aí é uma coisa que a gente. É, trabalha muito essas ferramentas técnicas que apoiam a governança nesses ambientes. Então, sei lá, na, na própria Wikipédia tem várias... Diferentes Wikipédias têm modelos de governança diferentes, então algumas delas, por exemplo, é, se você não está numa certa classe de usuário, você faz edições, as suas edições se, sobre, se, 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 se acumulam junto com as outras, mas não são mostradas para o público geral, por exemplo. É, e isso precisa passar antes por uma aprovação de alguém que já está... já é de confiança do projeto, em algum sentido, assim. É, então, enfim, tem, tem ferramentas aí e desenvolvimentos de processos técnicos também que podem apoiar esse, esse mecanismo de governança. Né? Só abusando um pouquinho aqui da minha posição, é, é porque na pesquisa que a gente vem desenvolvendo, uma das coisas que nós observamos, e até no, no paper do Paul David ele, ele fala um pouco nisso, é que ao mesmo tempo que existe toda, toda essa facilidade de compartilhamento de informação, pelo menos no nível das instituições de ensino e pesquisa, começa a haver também um engessamento com os chamados escritórios de inovação, etc., no sentido de ter que formalizar acordos e, em cada acordo, é, se de determinar muito claramente a questão da propriedade intelectual, da patente, etc. Então, existe essa dualidade, assim, né? que, que o tema, né? que a Luca até falou um pouco naquela nossa reunião, que o tema da inovação se impõe e isso 
invade a universidade, essa necessidade, essa imposição de uma formalização da cooperação também é, um, é um, algo que vem na contracorrente, mas que é uma, é uma realidade. Né? Mas, enfim. É, Ludmila, Anne, cadê o rapaz? Ludmila, Anne e Alessandro. Você também? É, boa, boa tarde a todos, obrigada pelas conferências. É, a minha pergunta vai para o Todd e também para o, para o David e para o Alexandre, em relação a uma, uma dicotomia, ou uma relação... De, é, vou, vou tratar assim, entre a questão da regulação propriamente, né, dentro da, da ciência aberta, e a questão da sustentabilidade. Tem sido conversado, apresentado, nos vários, é, nas várias conferências, questões em relação a essa a ciência grande, né, física, biologia, química, e outras iniciativas nas, nas áreas das humanidades. E me parece que, recentemente, nos Estados Unidos, o Obama... É, promulgou né, uma, uma lei em que, chegando a um determinado teto de investimento de qualquer projeto, independente de iniciativa privada ou iniciativa pública, esses dados precisam ser disponibilizados e qualquer cidadão, qualquer empresa pode se apropriar e produzir outros ou serviços ou produtos a partir desses, desses dados. Então, a minha pergunta é a seguinte... É, se vocês acham que é possível a produção de uma regulação que torne iniciativas de ciência aberta mais sustentáveis. Isso porque eu estava pensando aqui no exemplo da Ellen, no Jean Space, né, que, na verdade, né, é sustentada pela comunidade dos próprios biólogos que vão ali né, ofertar, de alguma maneira, ensino, aprendizagem para as comunidades interessadas. Na verdade, é, né, é a comunidade, é um tipo de, uma forma né, de sustentabilidade de um projeto de ciência aberta. Então, essa é a minha primeira questão é, para, né, para vocês. A segunda é especificamente para o David, em relação é, ao Reino Unido. Né? É, o Cameron. É. <risos> É, que é o seguinte, que é o seguinte, como é que no Reino Unido hoje, né, sei que ele, né, estão avançados a questão da curadoria né, desses dados científicos para o acesso direto né, dos cidadãos da, da sociedade. Como é que está sendo aí gerenciada a gestão mesmo? Né? Como é que é uma gestão do governo? Né, ou das universidades em relação a esse, a esse projeto. Obrigada. É, saindo um pouco desse âmbito mais, mais macro, indo para os indivíduos e para as motivações, é, no site do, que houve do simpósio em homenagem ao, ao Jean-Claude Berlin, o Cameron foi o único que apontou o quanto era difícil trabalhar com ele. É, todos é, apontaram o brilhantismo dele, mas ele foi o único que disse era muito, às vezes era chato, de tantas regras, e se você não aceitasse a regra dele, não havia jogo. Então, eu queria que se você pudesse comentar que regras são essas, porque é, nessa minha pesquisa inicial... Eu tenho encontrado muita gente que diz que faz caderno de pesquisa aberto, mas que, quando você vai olhar um pouco mais profundamente, é, parece ser mais um blog, pode ter essa preocupação de ser em tempo real, pode ter essa preocupação de ser aberto, mas, muitas vezes, diz assim, eu estou fazendo isso aqui para mim. Eu não estou com a preocupação de é, me tornar compreensível para outras pessoas. É, e uma segunda outra questão... É, que pesquisando também o, o blog dele, o primeiro, o Useful Cam, eu percebi que essa motivação da colaboração geralmente vinha. Quer dizer, esse blog também ele é datado, ele é de 2006, é mais ou menos de 2010, mas ele, ele atraía a, a colaboração dos outros quando ele começava a desenvolver algum tipo de serviço 
é, de informação, né? Então, geralmente era assim, ah, eu tentei fazer, ele disponibilizava alguma coisa e alguém como cliente falava assim, ah, eu tentei usar e não consegui. Mas eu não sentia uma colaboração é, além, para além disso nesse instrumento que eu comecei a pesquisar agora. Então, eu gostaria de que vocês pudessem comentar também que tipos de colaborações e quais são os limites dessas colaborações. Can I? Um, it's actually, well, my question is actually uh, sort of built on top of Ludmilla's and Anne, so it's, it's still on sustainability. Uh, so we're, we're, we've been talking about an open science that even at the level of open notebook and so on is, is more efficient. But I wonder if you, if you envision uh, a, a problem of scale. So given the scale of, of today's science, if the, eff, the, efforts, the efforts to maintain such an openness could be Uh, uh, might be uh, higher, too high for, not higher, too high for, uh, for somebody. So uh, is this just a cultural problem or do we have problems of organizational problems, disciplinary problems, uh, 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 economic problems, both at the macro level, which Ludmilla was mentioning, and the micro level that Anne An was, was mentioning. So is it really extendable to um, as much as we, as we would like to or do you envision problems in which the effort to maintain this openness will, you know, Uh, overcome the, 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 the outcomes. Uh, on the, the last thing, um, I don't know. I really don't know, and it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, you can make um, analogies with open source software, again. The, the, you, develop, you develop systems as you go along to deal with problems that you face, and, and you know, a lot of these, these systems don't really have any precedence. Um, but like any organization, you know, if, if it grows, you have to do new things. Um, we're at the very early stage of working like this, and I, I think if problems of scale emerge, then solutions will be found. And you can imagine structures, you know, fractal-like structures that grow according to how many people are involved. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm optimistic, though, based on what has happened in other fields. But I don't know. Um, There was something about uh, the, the, the um, I guess, opening up so sustainability um, with regards uh, labs and things, if I understood the question correctly. I mean, one of, one of the things I always want to do with, um, with chemistry projects is, is get a lot of um, people involved in doing experiments for, that might solve a problem um, from the public. And we have those in universities. I mean, in my university, there, we, we took the gates away from my university so that you can walk in from the street um, and you can walk through the campus and see all the buildings. What you can't do is walk into a lab because there's a door there and you can't get through. Uh, if we could get people into labs to do experiments on the weekend, that would be amazing. But you need then to sign the beta paper that says that, that your the university accepts responsibility if someone dies. And that's, that's the tricky thing. So the, the involvement of lots of people in a sustainable way is usually a paperwork on an insurance problem rather than something else. And it, shall I do all three? The, the, the last thing about people being annoying is a really good question. It's important to be annoying, right? It's a good thing to be annoying. And that was one of the good things about what Jean Claude did was be a little bit annoying because he would then stimulate you to think about, well, okay, he may have a point then. All right, I'm not going to admit it now, but he does actually have a point. So um, I'll change it slightly. <clears throat> and people are good that way, you know. I mean, the, the, Peter does the same thing about PDFs, right? And, and, and you know, you put a PDF up somewhere, and Peter will say, "No, nah, what are you doing? You can't do that." <laughs> so it's good to have those voices, um, and, and you, you have those on lots of uh, lots of bits of projects. I've got a guy at the moment who is continually critical of the way that we um, represent molecules so that they can be machine read, and it's the same thing every time we put something up that's slightly wrong. He'll come and say, "Ah, uh -uh, what are you doing?" So that, that's, but that's the value, isn't it? That's the value of having people with distinct opinions, being honestly critical of each other, um, is, is a tremendous value. So the criticism in itself is, is useful because it's honest and, and freely given. So yeah, to start, to start there, I mean, just to echo what, what Matt really said, is that he was, he could be a right pain in the ass. Um, but he was very targeted in how he did it um, and in doing that, and he was very deliberate and he was very upfront in as much as he said, he never really expected open notebook science as he defined it and practiced it to widely catch on. That wasn't the point. 
The point was to show that it was possible and to inspire a small group of people to be out on that radical extreme um, and to draw the rest of the world in that direction um, as a way of, of improving practice generally. I mean, that, certainly that's my interpretation. And yeah, that, that I'm a pragmatist. I like to get on with people. Um, and so I sit, I sit in the middle trying to draw the threads together and we need the people dragging us from the, from the edges out into um, the places where we need to be and, and in the right directions. Um, his intransigence in some cases could make it difficult for some people to collaborate with him and there were many potential collaborations that went by the by because people weren't ready or didn't understand and I think there was often actually that understanding piece of what the ground rules were was, was often missing. Um, but there were real collaborations that grew up out of it. I mean, I highlighted one or two along the way, but um, he started this project with no knowledge of who might test these compounds as anti-malarial compounds. Someone popped up, someone discovered him by a Google search um, and offered to start testing these compounds. Um, that happened years after they'd started making them. Um, he came across Andy Lang, um, who did a lot of the, the modeling work and, and inspired a lot of the, the web services um, stuff and again, you know, he engaged Andy. He, he engaged in building the, the 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 software tools that were actually used to to make this work. Um, the iOS apps, um, working with um, Tony with ChemSpider and continually requesting new things, new capabilities from ChemSpider as he wanted to put more things in place. Um, and then the myriad of people he worked with in, in Second Life. I mean, it's, again, coming back, it's an interesting thing to come back to, but he almost single-handedly provoked large numbers of organisations into creating these really quite vibrant presence, presences in Second Life. Now, it turns out not very many people came to them, and so there wasn't a community around that. But I think the provocation is still is, is something that pushed Nature Publishing Group and the American Chemical Society and many universities into thinking about online engagement in a broader sense. So you asked, you asked what the rules were, and actually one of the interesting things is that he, he wrote down a set of rules over time, and they were different and they changed, um, and they were never as precise as the six laws that, that Matt put down. Um, the real principal one was no insider information. But of course, there was always insider information because it took time to get the recording up there. And I, I sort of introduced the words as soon as practicable, that the results should be in line as soon as is practicable. Um, and that was always a fairly vague thing to say. But the, the, the fundamental rules were everything that was recorded should be made available and everything that sh sh was recorded should be made available to anyone as soon as possible. Um, and in any case, no later than 12 hours after it was recorded. Um, and you can see some of the work that Shirley Wu did on some of these badges um, for, you know, some, some people might want to say, yes, they were making stuff available, but not everything. Or some people might want to say um, they were making everything available, but after some delay, um, for whatever reason. And, and he was engaged in creating the markers that would allow people to say that, but he would also come down like a... 50-ton hammer if someone said that was open notebook science. Um, so the sustainability question um, is, is hard. So it's very brief, but just to say that at the memorial service in Cambridge on July the 14th, uh, there were, I think, 13 presenters. We hope to, uh, well, we have captured that on streaming uh, video. We haven't yet put that together, but you will get, you'll be able to see some of the things that people have said. Um, now, one of the things I'd say just at this stage is that more than one person said that he was very much loved by his students, um, and that was a major part of what he did. Uh, now, how he got on with his students, I don't know. You may be able to pick it up from some of these testimonies. Governance, governance, data management. Right, I remember. There were lots of questions. Um, so the data management thing is, is a complex, um, frankly, it's a bit of a mess. Um, so most of the funders in the UK now have a 
relatively strong uh, policies about data sharing on paper. Um, none of them have any mechanism for actually tracking compliance or monitoring pretty much anything at all. Um, what one of those funding agencies has done is placed a responsibility on the institutions to make data available on a reasonable time scale, whatever that means, um, and to responsibly manage the data that's generated as part of the research projects they fund. Now, several people have mentioned the distinction between the data as it occurs in the lab and the data that you might share and the data that we currently sometimes make available in the wrong form in supplementary data. And it's unclear, very unclear, um, for most of these policies at what level the expectation of collection and collation is. Um, you know, I think it from, from Matt's, there's huge advantages in ensuring that you capture everything. Um, so the management systems are simply not in place. Uh, the competencies to understand what is necessary and what needs to be built to be general at an institutional level, frankly, not in place. Um, and those disciplines that have good subject repositories or good specific data repositories are well ahead of the rest of the of the rest of the, the country. So the challenge lies in, in understanding we can we, we know we can build good infrastructure for specific data types from specific disciplines. And we know that that probably shouldn't be done at the institutional level and should be done at some sort of subject level. That creates all sorts of problems. The sustainability, as we heard from uh, earlier, with the you know, keg database and other things becoming unavailable after time because the funding runs out. Um, institutions are good modes for funding things because they have core funding and they manage infrastructure, but they generally don't have the breadth of um, the scale for any one type of data. You know, any given research group in any given institution is probably the only research group creating quite that kind of data in that institution. So building an infrastructure for everyone in the institution is problematic. Um, it's better for that to be shared. So we have to figure out funding models that allow us to share platforms for infrastructure. Um, we're very bad at doing funding across national boundaries. We're very bad still, I think, at funding long-term infrastructure that's in some sense shared across multiple institutions within a single country. Um, and those are things we have to work out. Um, it goes back to these questions actually of scale. Um, it's, it's all very well when a single group can spin up a single server doing a single thing, um, create this database which is fun and great. And, you know, but there are, what, 17,000 databases in the last nucleic acids research database issue, of which you, know, you look back one year at the 17,000 that were published last year, 12,000 of those don't exist anymore. Um, so it's a problem. I don't, I don't have any simple answers beyond the fact that we have to figure out how to fund infrastructure properly. Less projects, more infrastructure. Just adding to Cameron's comments of it, I think a model that we might at least shed some hope and might be an inspiration is how the astronomy community organizes. Is they have necessarily have this joint international infrastructure project and they have this joint international databases and everything is mirrored and shared and it's out on in a non alternational uh, form. So that might might be a way. Well, that shows that it's possible to somehow design something that scales, at least technically. And then uh, there's somebody out there who's figured out economically and, and institutionally how to do that. Uh, I think also like Organizations like the Wikimedia Foundation might play an in interesting role in this, although they're still distant and not interested in, not directly interested in, in okay, I, I, I'm speaking in English, I could be speaking in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just go on then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, where, I did, where was I? Um, yeah, but uh, if we can get their interest, like they, they already fund the global encyclopedia collaborative. Like this is this is an open science project. I mean, uh, there's no reason that uh, 
similar institutions might not arise, or the very Wikimedia media foundation whose mission is broad enough to sustain some of this kind of work. So, there's, uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Daniel, one. Yeah, I would like to add a perspective um, of some researcher who works in a different discipline. So, so far we've uh, talked about the in influence of open notebook science on the field directly and on outreach to the public. Uh, but I'm a biophysicist, and uh, at the time when I became aware of uh, Jean-Claude's uh, work and the basic idea of doing open notebook science, I was working in a psychology department and a psychiatry department. And um, so I had kind of carefully danced around chemistry without touching it too closely. And uh, nonetheless, I've spent more time in chemical notebooks than in biophysical notebooks, simply because those chemical ones became uh, um, accessible. And I use them to uh, consider aspects of workflows, like uh, what is the best way to make my own workflows open? What are the best ways to expose um, failures? What are the best ways to bring in someone? Many of those things I learned actually through uh, open notebook chemistry. Um, and th this also influenced my approach uh, of open source software. So I kind of became interested in open source software through the back door of open source chemistry. Um, and then that was actually closer to my own work. Uh, and so that's, since it's open, uh, you have multiple different ways of interacting and uh, that, that is a dimension that should just shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, olá, uh, minha pergunta é uma pergunta, sugestão, a respeito da persistência dos dados que foi levantado, o Tom falou, o uh, Matthew uh, falou, a respeito do, uh, se um link vai estar disponível depois de alguns anos, né, de um link que foi colocado num, numa referência de um artigo, isso também vem de, uh, perguntando sobre que tipo de materiais a gente consegue colocar num artigo? Se a gente pode botar um SVG, um arquivo SVG ou um vídeo. Então, talvez isso tem se resolvido com material suplementar. Vem um artigo e além disso vem um material suplementar que vai o vídeo, vai planilhas e etc. Será que nesse material suplementar não caberia o, o caderno, o open notebook, o caderno científico aberto também num formato? que talvez seja um pacote de acordo com algum padrão, talvez sugerido pela W3C, o, uh, o comitê da World Wide Web, que eles definem padrões para a internet, talvez se, se, seja inspirado nisso, talvez tenha que se fazer um trabalho dessa ordem de magnitude, definir padrões, certamente inspirados no que a web já, já tem definido, tanto o SVG é um arquivo padrão que já é aceito pelo... Uh, pelo comitê do, do World Wide Web. Então, isso talvez permitiria a exportação de pacotes que seja somente leitura, mas que estejam de referência para poder fazer uma análise a mais a longo prazo, né, uma persistência de mais longo prazo do material. Então, eu vou voltar na pergunta também, do, novamente, do caderno físico, a questão do caderno físico. É, muito interessante a, tudo que você mostrou de química, Cameron. É, eu, eu não conhecia, muito legal mesmo. E eu fico imaginando, eu, eu não sei como funciona na química, mas nas biociências é, existe uma grande questão envolvendo o, o caderno físico. É, algum, alguns institutos da, da minha universidade ah, até dizem que o caderno é, pa, é propriedade do laboratório. Então, eles criam essa norma, então, necessariamente, pressupõe-se a existência de um caderno físico. Então, ah, ok, a gente está falando de cadernos científicos abertos, então, a gente também já pressupõe a existência de um caderno virtual e não físico. É, e quando eu tentei propor para meus orientadores, que eu, que eu já tive, a adoção de, 
é, cadernos abertos e virtuais, né? portanto, é, eles vieram com dois grandes argumentos contra essa ideia. O primeiro foi que o caderno físico é, seria é, uma maneira de eu comprovar a uh, inocência no caso, no caso se eu for acusado de alguma fraude científica ou coisa do tipo. Ou também de, de comprovar que alguma tecnologia que eu desenvolvi é de fato minha, se caso uh, alguém me questionar sobre algum, alguma questão de uh, propriedade intelectual. Então, nesse caso, o, o que deve ser feito quando você tem normas que evitam que você tenha um caderno aberto e, e que você tem toda essa cultura que impeça você ter esse caderno aberto. O que fazer nesses casos? Assim? Não sei. Otherwise, otherwise I'll forget. Um, so what I, the, the physical notebook question is one that we, we worked through quite a lot um, and we had those kinds of conversations. Um, the, the, the brutal answer is um, the pharmaceutical industry, the industry that cares more about patents and proof than any other industry anywhere in the world, has moved entirely to electronic lab notebooks because they are more reliable and more trusted and the FDA prefers them. I mean, the, the, world, the world has moved on. Um, paper can be modified um, and isn't, isn't as, isn't as um, reliable as people think it is, not even, not even for archival purposes. And the tools, the tools are now there to create um, validated electronic records. The weak link in any sort of ethical or legal case relating to a record of research, the weak link is never the record It is always the human failure to record the thing properly, to follow the process in practice. Um, and this is, this is well established in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. So actually, so having a, if, if you only have a very poor electronic record, which isn't validated and isn't reliable, then yes, you probably want a paper backup. Um, what, and I faced exactly this problem in, in my group. We had exactly the requirement that the department insisted on having a paper copy of the notebook. So we took the website and we printed it out and we put it in the archive and that made everyone happy. Um, I can't remember what Raphael's question was, but I remember that I wanted to answer it. Oh, oh so, stand, so standards. So, so, this is, so this is really interesting. So um, as Matt did, we, we, when we published a paper, we tried to put a lab notebook um, the exported lab notebook, which is basically a static website. Um, and it was too big for the submission systems and it was a pain in the neck. But actually Biomed Central for a while, I'm not sure whether they still do this, but they have allowed you to create a mini website, which is essentially, you know, static HTML, um, which is what LabTrove actually exports. Um, and I think that's a great starting point. You know, that is W3 standards. Um, If it should render directly in a browser, you can either serve it from a website or you can take a copy for yourself. So I think that's a great thing to build on. Some really interesting questions about what people, whether, how you manage the situation where people want to have nice, whizzy, interactive JavaScript widgets in the lab notebook. Do you force them to archive a version that is static in some way that you know, that helps cross-site scripting issues, et cetera, et cetera, those kinds of things. But absolutely. Um, something that is basically probably HTML5, static HTML5 pages, um, maybe some CSS, um, would be a great way to do this. It, it already could work. Just, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I find this issue, the, the two issues very interesting. Um, with the... I, I forget what the project's called. Is it the thousand year document project or something? There's someone somewhere trying to create something as a document which will last a thousand years. And it's actually a really hard thing to do, you know. Um, hieroglyphs, right? We have things in Egyptian tombs that have lasted thousands of years, but anything that we have on us now, we can't guarantee for 10, let alone a thousand. So um, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not so easy to guarantee the permanence of something. We assume that by putting a paper into a journal, that it will last forever. That's, that's why we do it, for that permanence. And I assume that when we put something in the university repository at Sydney, it's going to last forever. I mean, it's hopelessly naive, right? If Skynet gets built, it's all over, right? So it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's, not, let's, let's be optimistic. So um, 
So the so but but it is important that we we work with good standards that people are developing. So with the lab notebook, I didn't know you did that. With the, I must find what you did with that. With the exported lab book, um, it's yes, it's a static HTML thing. So at the moment, everyone should be able to read that. Um, with the paper we're submitting just now on the malaria project, there's a bunch of conversations we want to capture that happened on a website. And to ensure that we're going to capture those, we're, we're again, downloading it as a PDF, and, and we're submitting that. Just because that's the only way we can guarantee that's going to be captured in, as, as, in, a, in a way that a journal will accept. Now, maybe we could do it with HTML, but at the moment it's fairly easy to capture an image. Because it's just capturing the, the record of something which we then reference. And we supply the link, but we can't guarantee the web page is going to be there. So these are, these are kind of workarounds until something better is found. But you, you just have to use things that are, that are reasonable, I think. Um, and I mean, I'd absolutely agree with what Cameron said about the, um, about the lab book. Um, if, if someone tells you that they need a physical lab book, they're just wrong. That's it. Hello. Uh, eu achei. Opa. É. Dzz, dzz. Eu, não, achei gostei bastante da, da do ponto que o Daniel trouxe aí é, sobre a dimensão dos cadernos abertos para o público. Né? Acho que a gente realmente, essa sessão, acabou discutindo muito das consequências para a própria ciência, ou para a própria comunidade profissional, científica, né? mas, evidentemente, tem, uma for tem, tem, tem um componente muito forte, e, e certamente é um motivador muito grande para mim, é, de, de que você pode, através disso, é, ter uma atitude bem diferente, uma atitude, como cientista revelar ou, ou passar uma atitude diferente para o público de que você está querendo trazer ele mais para perto ou que tá, que, de que ele não é não está fora do, 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 do universo da, da, da ciência, de que ele, muito pelo contrário, ele é a parte que mais interessa, porque, inclusive, ele é o financiador desse universo. É, então, acho que, para mim, isso é uma coisa... E a, mane e a maneira como isso, é, seja através de jornalistas, seja através de pessoas interessadas, e você tem cada vez mais, hoje em dia... É, comunidades de prática, comunidades listas de discussão em assuntos específicos que vão atrás de, de, de dissecar a própria ciência. Então, tem artigos mostrando, por exemplo, é, listas de parentes de, de, de pacientes com tal doença, ou listas de e-mail de, de, é, de mulheres querendo saber sobre certos procedimentos de, gravi, de, de, de certas formas de gravidez, é, ou certas formas de parto, Uh, e essas listas tem trabalho científico mostrando que essas listas elas não param é, na mera reprodução da literatura ou na reprodução do, do jornalismo é, essas pessoas começam a se especializar e tentar é, se tornar o mais tentar se tornar tão capazes quanto uma pessoa é, da área quanto um profissional da área para tirar suas próprias conclusões e criar uma capacidade da própria sociedade de raciocinar e, e ser também uma, uma, uma avaliadora, uma curadora e uma produtora desse conhecimento. Né? É, então, eu acho que é fundamental a ciência se abrir cada vez mais para isso, porque é uma demanda, e é uma demanda prática, e também, é, como o Jorge falou mais cedo hoje, é uma demanda política cada vez mais, é, coerente com a forma como a ciência se apresenta e se justifica perante a sociedade. Então, né? uh, além de poder justamente ter todos esses efeitos com outros de fertilização com outros domínios da ciência e tudo mais. É, e do, é, sobre o que o Otto falou, eu acho que especificamente sobre os cadernos de pesquisa, acho que isso é mais uma coisa que entra é, em questão essa existência de certas organizações é, confiáveis que sejam é, referências para, por exemplo, é, estabelecer é esse, não só a, a preservação desses registros, como você falou, na caso de provar uma inocência, mas, é, mas que sejam confiáveis para estabelecer a, a, a primazia, das, o, o, o metadado, a, a datação das, das, das contribuições. Né? Então, quer dizer, se você é, tem o seu próprio, ou sua, sua instituição tem o seu próprio laboratório, tem o seu próprio caderno, o seu próprio software rodando no seu próprio computador, Alguém poderia dizer que você, tendo acesso a tudo ali, gostaria de modificar a data de uma certa contribuição sua para parecer que você inventou uma coisa antes, ou para, enfim. É, então, por exemplo, se você usar uma infraestrutura compartilhada, que onde tem uma certa supervisão coletiva do que está acontecendo, como, por exemplo, os projetos Wikimedia ou é, algo assim, 
você tem um pouco mais essa garantia de que aquilo serve como uma é um, é um, é um argumento muito mais forte de em caso de você ter que é, contestar uma primazia é, numa disputa de, de autoria de alguma de alguma coisa e coisas assim né? então acho que tem esse papel também dessas dessas organizações né é só isso obrigado okay, então temos as duas últimas perguntas Ranier e a pergunta remota que o Paulo vai ler ah, não é exatamente uma pergunta, é só um comentário. É, acabou surgindo agora, no final do evento, a questão de, da preservação, do, de, não dos artigos, mas dos cadernos de notebooks e é, páginas web. Porque, não é, como a gente sabe, tipo, a web não é, preserva, não, é, ela não é... Ela acaba saindo do ar várias páginas, porque as pessoas tiram elas do ar ou... Elas, ou alguma coisa acontece. Então, por exemplo, como o projeto do Henrique, que o Abdo citou, ele estava na, na inovação FAPESP, e aí a inovação foi um projeto extinto, o, e aí ele teve que usar a Wayback Machine para conseguir ter uma... ver como que a página estava, mas não é apenas as páginas saírem do ar, tem um problema também das páginas mudarem, como, por exemplo, a Wikipedia, se alguém cita... Se eu cito hoje uma referência a uma página da Wikipedia, Amanhã ela vai estar diferente, pode, isso pode ser uma parte significativa de diferença. Uh, no mês passado, eu assisti uma palestra do Ebert, agora não lembro o sobrenome dele, ele trabalhou, trabalha com um projeto chamado Memento, que utiliza a infraestrutura de vários archives, como o The Web, Wayback, Web, Web Back Machine, que o Abdo citou. Então, seria um, um tema interessante para o encontro do próximo ano que a gente tivesse. Obrigado. Então, é, temos uma pergunta de um, do Ricardo Guimarães, também conhecido como Guima, que está em São Paulo, no Hacker Space Garoa Hacker Club. E a pergunta dele é, é que ele gostaria de saber sobre a visão das wiki pesquisas e cadernos abertos feitos por pesquisadores independentes, não vinculados formalmente a uma comunidade acadêmica. Então, essas pesquisas podem ser, de alguma forma, qualificada por um grupo acadêmico? Essa é a questão colocada pelo Ricardo. Quer, quer comentar alguma coisa? Would you like to say something about this? Uh, well, yeah, on the, on the uh, last one. I've got your thing, your thing still. <laughs> on the last one, um, can they be, I mean, yes, they can, can they be assessed and, and used? And yes, I mean, like any contribution. Um, they they can be fed into a you know group project. Does it happen? Yes, I, I mean it does. You know, we, on the Malaria project, we have inputs from consultants who are not affiliated with any organization. Um, we've got a 16-year-old kid commenting at the moment on the project, um, who who just is a lives in New York and just is interested in suggesting molecules. Um, so so yes, you can include those things. And and again, it just it's a case of you know mentorship and and guidance, but. It's a, uh, it's open to anybody, and and and, and whether, you don't assess whether someone is qualified to input. You just take the the contributions on merit. So it's quite straightforward. So I guess in part response to to Ali, but also some of the other concerns. I mean, these these issues about date stamping and seeing whether something's changed. These are all solved technical problems. You, you, they require infrastructure. They require systems. Um, and that, that requires resources, and we have to decide whether that's important enough. I mean, one of the things we discovered on very early in our own lab notebook work was we thought the smart thing was to never allow any change to the record, and then we realized that was a really dumb thing to do because you made spelling mistakes. And it was an electronic system, so we could make a record of all the changes. The, it's, again, that's an adva advantage of the electronic record over paper. I can change it, and it's fine to change it because the record of the changes can be kept. Um, but you need ways and you need trusted third parties to manage you know, cryptographic keys or whatever technique you're going to use to do that. But it's all, it's all possible. This, que this question of you know, contribution, I think it's, it's critical. Uh, one of the things that, and I guess we haven't talked that much about this, but open, open is about more than just making things available to people. It's about providing routes for engagement. Um, to, I think it was, was Ali's point that um, 
there are many people, particularly people who are engaged in rare diseases, um, either because they have them themselves or because their children do, who are far more expert on the disease than their own physician. Um, there are real citizen experts that are true, ex you know, true experts in the traditional sense we would, we would think of. And then there are, other, there are other people who have very specific, what Michael Nielsen calls micro-expertise, you know, the specific piece of knowledge that's in critical to solve this problem, the insight, the connection. Not that they're an expert in the domain area, but that they know the one thing that will help you figure out the answer to the problem. And all of those contributions are valuable, and those are the ones we, we want to seek to make, but also to, ena to enable. But Michael's other insight was, we've talked quite a lot about money, but money actually isn't really the issue. Um, the most valuable resource in the research system is the attention of experts. That's what costs the money in the system. It's the attention of people who can do something. And I don't mean, an expert is not someone who's paid a salary by a university. An expert is someone who can contribute specialist expertise that is, that is unusual or unique. Um, and that's what we want to enable, and we need to both protect the time of experts from having their time wasted, and also in, uh, open up the pathways to allow anyone who might not be credentialed, who might not look like, who might be the 16-year-old, um, who might be Hanny, who do, um, Hanny, I can't remember a second name. Um, the, the person who discovered the green, the, 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 these unusual features in astronomical pictures that, that turned out to be an actual new form of galaxy, a new form of astronomical object. These contributions matter and they're important and that's part of what we're trying to enable. So credentialing is problematic because it excludes people. But credentialing is critical because we need to make sure that people's time isn't being wasted. And I, again, there's not a clear answer as to how you manage those interactions. Um, the right to speak is not the right to be listened to, necessarily. Um, but we have to figure out how to find those people um, who can contribute and to help them contribute and to make sure they feel those contrib contributions are, val are valuable, val valued wherever they are coming from. Obrigada. Alexandre, a gente... Ela, porque eu... É bem rápido. Porque ela está na hora da tradução ter o seu descanso. A gente tem que... Então, rapidinho, só respondendo, acho que só acrescentaria ao, ao, ao Cameron que, no caso específico que o René mencionou da Wikipédia, se você está preocupado com a página, você não cita a página, você cita a versão dela específica. Então, isso quer dizer, como ele falou, é um problema que, algum, esses problemas tecnicamente tem, tem soluções, né? já são resolvidos, inclusive. E sobre a questão dos das pesquisas feitas por pesquisadores independentes, eu acho que as respostas foram um pouco mais no sentido de pesquisadores independentes participando em pesquisas abertas, uh, mas eu acho que as, as considerações todas valem, para caso também, de pesquisas iniciadas por pesquisadores independentes, que eventualmente se tornem de interesse da, da, de, de pesquisadores profissionais que venham a adotar. E acho que a gente teve exemplos aqui na, na discussão da, dos hackerspaces, quando, particularmente no Genspace, de é, trabalhos e pesquisas que surgiram ali, que foram adotados e estão, recebe, estão conseguindo se prosseguir com colaboração de equipamentos nas universidades que o próprio Gente Space não tem. Né? Então, acho que esse é uma coisa, é uma via de dois, dois sentidos mesmo, e é, o mesmo lugar mesmo. Ok, então, obrigada. Acho que foi ótimo. É... Vamos fazer um intervalo de 15 minutos, depois voltar para mais uma homenagem, que eu acho que o Jean-Claude foi super homenageado, mas eu acho que tem algumas palavras mais que a gente queria fazer e, e fazer uma sessão final, de uma rodada final de desdobramentos, enfim. Bom, então a gente vai dar início à parte final aí do nosso encontro. A ideia é agora a gente fazer uma singela homenagem ao tão falado nessa última sessão e no dia de hoje todo, na verdade, ao Jean-Claude Bradley, que estava convidado para vir esse seminário, inclusive já com passagem comprada para vir ao seminário, e aconteceu esse trágico incidente, e que nós lamentamos muito. E, então, eu queria convidar a aluna de doutorado é, do nosso programa de pós-graduação em Ciência da Informação, que é um programa 
desenvolvido entre o IBICT e a UFRJ, é, a Anne Clínio, cujo tema de pesquisa de doutorado é justamente os, os cadernos científicos abertos, e que, é, portanto, tem feito um extenso trabalho em torno do, das propostas, enfim, do, do Jean-Claude. Então, a Anne vai falar algumas palavras e depois vai passar um pequeno vídeo e depois, então, a gente vai para a parte final. Bem, é, eu vou ler porque eu acho que fica mais fácil para mim. É, de repente, não mais que de repente, como diz um poeta brasileiro, o meu nome foi sugerido para participar da homenagem do Jean-Claude Bradley. E eu confesso que eu me senti muito desafiada com essa proposta. Como prestar homenagem de maneira adequada a alguém que eu não conheci pessoalmente? Pior que isso, como falar do Jean-Claude depois de uma mesa sobre Open Notebook Science? É, depois da palestra do Peter Murray Rust, esse simpático senhor, fundador do Blue Obelisk, um grupo informal de químicos que premiou Jean-Claude em 2007, por suas contribuições para Open Data, Open Source e Open Standards. Ainda assim, como eu poderia complementar a fala do Cameron Nalon, com quem o Bradley desenvolveu o Open Notebook Science Challenge durante uma viagem de trem em 2008? Ou ainda, como eu poderia acrescentar alguma coisa ao depoimento do Matthew, com quem o Jean-Claude compartilhava o interesse pelo desenvolvimento aberto de medicamentos para a malária? A minha alternativa, então, foi falar do Jean-Claude pela perspectiva de quem está pesquisando as suas ideias e a sua aplicação por cientistas em diversos campos do conhecimento. Eu estou fazendo essa pesquisa através dos milhares de posts que ele escreveu, as dezenas de vídeos, podcasts, artigos, atas de reuniões, é, grant proposals, livros, serviços de informação, bases de dados, tudo isso que ele criou. Tudo quase que obsessivamente aberto, uma abertura em grau máximo. Para mim, a proposta do Open Notebook Science tornou-se um tema de pesquisa instigante. Transformou o processo, às vezes penoso, de um doutorado em algo fervilhante. Devolveu a minha curiosidade genuína, vontade de aprender e o prazer de pesquisar. Desde que eu comecei essa pesquisa, eu não paro de conhecer pessoas, de me conectar a elas, de transformar arrobas em carne e osso. Eu não paro de produzir, de conhecer coisas novas, de melhorar a documentação da minha pesquisa, de buscar soluções para a construção do meu próprio caderno. E também pensar o papel da ciência na sociedade. Ontem, o Cameron Nail mostrou uma, uma imagem de uma janela, de onde se via um jardim com uma grama bem verdinha e algumas árvores. Essa janela seria a ciência aberta, servindo como uma espécie de moldura para observar o que acontece lá fora. Jean-Claude Bradley foi um dos primeiros a se aproximar dessa janela e, ao olhar o jardim, viu as milhares de abelhas operárias para utilizar a metáfora da Maria Lúcia Maciel, trabalhando incessantemente e se esmerando para produzir quilos e quilos de mel em uma estrutura hierarquizada e desigual. Ao contrário de outros pesquisadores que estudam os modos de produzir e comunicar a ciência, o Bradley não estava interessado em contar o que era contável a quantidade de mel produzida por ano, o índice H da geleia real. Essas medidas aproximadas que não representam o que há de mais fértil e rico no trabalho das abelhas. Bradley queria saber do que conta e contar o que sabe, e saber em quanto conta, pois esses processos não são separados e muito menos solitários. Ele se interessava pela fertilização cruzada, a polinização de ideias, a incorporação de novos genes, a produção de plantas e frutos mais fortes e saudáveis nos jardins das ciências. Peter me contou que as ideias de Jean-Claude Bradley não foram compreendidas de imediato, mas as constantes menções ao seu nome e ao conceito de Open Notebook Science durante esse seminário podem indicar um novo momento, em que, está, em que se está mais maduro, preparado ou corajoso para dar esse passo que ele já tinha ter visto. Não ser compreendido em seu próprio tempo é a sina dos pioneiros, mas ainda não é tarde demais para dizer obrigado e dar continuidade ao que ele começou. Certamente foi o que buscamos fazer aqui. A Anne vai passar, então, um pequeno trecho de um vídeo... 
right, so I will try to explain to you this, these two concepts uh, of the synthesis of antimalarial compounds at Open Notebook Science in the next 15 minutes. Well, this is actually a pretty good time to give this talk. Uh, this week we actually got our Wikipedia entry for Open Notebook Science. It turns out that uh, it required a lot of people's coordinated efforts and it required a body of work before we were able to do this. But if you go on Wikipedia, you can learn a lot more that I don't have time to explain uh, today. The idea of Open Notebook Science is basically to report the work that you do in the laboratory in real time, or as close as you can to real time, so that the entire world knows as much as you do about your research. Uh, like I said, there's a number of references here that you can take a look at the <clears throat> background of this. But the motivation is that, well, it should be self-evident that it's a way to do faster science, right, compared to either not disclosing some things or, you know, significantly delaying them. And I think it's also a way of doing better science, which is not immediately obvious, but I'll, hopefully I'll show you some examples of how that can be. Okay, now to the, to the synthesis part. So we're a synthetic organic chemistry group, and the, our target is uh, malaria, and specifically falsopane 2. Malaria, uh, as you should know, is a disease that's spread by mosquitoes, and here's actually the malarial parasite inside of the red blood cell. And it uses this enzyme, falsopane 2, to metabolize hemoglobin. So if we can inhibit that enzyme, it can be a way to basically stop the, the, the process of it replicating. And so what we've done is we've collaborated with a group at Indiana University, Rajarshi Guha. I was telling you about it's a way of doing better science, and it really comes down to where's the beef when you talk about your experiments. So this is a blog post here where we are talking about doing different things, and it says see experiment 150 for more information. So this is the Yugi reaction that I'll be mentioning over and over in this talk. And if you click on that link, it takes you to the lab notebook page, experiment 150, and this actually looks very similar to what it would look like in a paper notebook. And that's on purpose. We want to make things as easy as possible for people to get involved with open notebook science. So you have an objective and you have all these different hyperlinks. So one of the things that you can link to, and this is a pretty long page, I'm just going to skip through it, give you examples. You can hit that Yugi Attic link and it takes you to an entry in ChemSpider. ChemSpider is a free database that has over 21 million compounds. You can do substructure searching, you can do all kinds of things for free, and I don't have to worry about that on my server. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. We're trying to get high quality information processing without having to become computer scientists to do it. And that's becoming really possible to do. We also link to the docking procedure that our collaborator Rajarshi uses. Again, here the idea is that this is replicatable. Someone who has done docking before should be able to get enough information from this page to generate the same compounds in the same order. All right, so these are called SMILES codes, and they're convenient ways of representing molecular structures, and you can just dump them in, data, in, in um, spreadsheets. So it's a pretty convenient way. But again, this is all made explicit, so you don't have to ask the researcher for permission. You can just go and look at the results. Another very uh, helpful thing is our spectra. Uh, if you know anything about organic chemistry, you know that the basis of it is spectra, especially NMR spectra. And there's actually a very neat way, if you have your NMR spectrum in a JCAMP format, you can run uh, JSpecView so that someone who doesn't know anything about Java or anything just hits this link and this spectrum pops up and it's actually interactive. So you can use your mouse and drag across any peak and it will expand it. So again here, this is what I'm talking about doing better science. You know, maybe you didn't expand that peak in your paper, maybe you didn't talk about it. But you know, if I'm trying to replicate this or I'm trying to extend your research, maybe I'm interested in that peak. Maybe I want to measure it. And so you know, this is it's just more details. So by the time we end up with the final conclusion, and it says that this Yugi product was obtained 59% yield, you don't have to take our word for it. It's all backed up either well or poorly, but it's all backed up. You know exactly what's supporting that statement. Uh, if you're not familiar with a wiki, uh, the reason that we use it for a lab notebook is that every time there's a change made, it tells you who made the change and exactly when, and we have a third-party timestamp for it. So we can claim that we knew what we knew exactly when, and we're not running the timestamp. It's run on a third party that's you know, well-respected. So that could be interesting down the road to settle claims. We can compare any two versions, and using Wikispaces, it lets you, it basically uh, shows you the stuff in green is the stuff that was added, the stuff in red was deleted. 
So it's a really nice way for to understand what people are good at, right? Because this is a collaboration. Many people in a lab working together. Certain people are good at things, and other people are good at other things. And this is a really good way to keep track of all that. Um, so we did these experiments, and we had enough material to publish a paper. So here's another use of the wiki, where we actually wrote the paper in the wiki. So every single draft was saved, and we can go back and see exactly how the paper was written. And the really nice thing about having a notebook to point to is, see, I can have reference nine, nine, uh, 11 be the melting point of the compound, and I can specify the batch that it was taken from, from experiment 99, whereas the proton NMR was taken from experiment 203, sample A11. So that information is typically not part of a, of a typical publication. You assume that the guy knows what he's doing and that he's actually characterizes his compounds properly. Well, that is not always the case, as we find out painfully. So here we can actually go and see if there's a problem with a specific batch if we're not getting the same information. Now, where we actually submit the, sub, submitted this paper is kind of interesting. It's called uh, Journal of Visualized Experiments, JOVE. And so there's a written part to this that I just showed you. That was what we wrote on the wiki. And they actually sent some camera people to record our experiments. And so this is now under peer review, and we should hear back uh, you know, shortly about this. And I don't see any, any problems. I don't expect any problems. And so this will be a nice way to communicate you know, with, with video as well. So there's so many tools now that make communicating your science faster without losing anything. Another thing that the physicists have been using for a while is preprint servers. So chemistry really didn't have a good preprint server. Well, they did, but that's a whole other story. It's no longer working. So Nature actually recently came up with this Nature Proceedings, which is a preprint server, and it's backed with the editorial filter of the Nature Publishing Group. If you're not familiar with Nature, it's one of the most well-respected uh, publishers out there. So if they basically say that this has good scientific quality, it's probably true. And so we can, before publication in Jove or any peer-reviewed journal that we choose to, to publish in, we can actually link to this document People can comment on this document, they can vote on it, they can give us feedback. You can have versioning on here. All kinds of things you can do. Normally, when you have a paper out, you just tell people, well, you know, it's going to come out next week, and when it does, here's the link. Well, here now you can actually give a link, and you have, you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. Now, and so far as the malaria project, <clears throat> that's actually important because that's how we make our compounds with this UV reaction. And so recently, we've actually gotten some results about this. We have four compounds that actually are active, both in inhibiting the enzyme, and they're also uh, effective in inhibiting the infection of Plasmodium falciparum. So, and these are in the micromolar range, so it's not bad. I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely publishable stuff. And there's different stories here. We used uh, one receptor area on the enzyme here. We used another receptor here. I don't have time to get into it, but. It's kind of interesting the results that are coming out of this. And again, this is out in the open, and uh, we never know who's going to stop by to collaborate. A last little story. Uh, I, w I recently did a little trip in the UK, and uh, my friend here, Cameron Nalen, who also does open notebook science, although he uses a different system than I do, we had the chance to spend a day in the lab to do experiments. And one of the things that evolved from my trip um, is, a, is a new, very simple project uh, using um, open notebooks. And we uh, spent the day measuring solubilities. So we took a bunch of compounds and we took a bunch of organic solvents and measured the solubilities. And then we reported these solubilities in a Google Doc. Now this is actually very interesting. So for Bach glycine, right, and methanol, we're measuring 4.4 molar. And you notice that that's in green. And down here, um, for D-glucose and methanol, there's a, well, we do get a number, right, it's 0.05. But I put it in red, and I don't actually include that number in my, five, in my final results because I'm not satisfied that I'm going to stand behind these. I don't think that 1.8 milligrams in the way that we were measuring it is good enough to report this. But what if you want a ballpark estimate? You can still access my number, and you have all the details of the context in which it was taken. So again, that's better science, I think. And what we're trying to do with this project, it's actually related to the malaria project in the sense that if we can uh, measure solubilities, report them publicly, and then build models, and Rajarshi Guha is going to help us build models of solubility, we should be able to predict the yields of these Yugi reactions in different solvents. So the idea is, is for this Yugi product, you should do it in 51% methanol, 
4% ethanol and the rest is nitrile. So that would be a very powerful thing that could be used not just for our project, but really anyone. And to sort of get this, this, this ball rolling, I set up this Open Notebook Science Challenge. And what it is is essentially, you know, we're asking people from around the world to contribute their measurements so long as they link them to a well-maintained notebook. And if they do that, then we can use these results and we can publish with them. You know, we can do everything that we, you know, that, that we do as scientists. And we have uh, a sponsor, Aldrich, has actually volunteered to ship compounds anywhere in the world uh, to encourage people to do this. So I'm very excited about this. It's a new initiative and I think uh, has a good chance of working. Uh... Bom, chegamos então aí, eu acho que não é difícil de acreditar que a gente passou uma semana inteira trabalhando com esse assunto, quando há tão pouco tempo atrás a gente começou a juntar algumas pessoas que estavam despertando interesse aqui no Brasil, acho mais ainda difícil de imaginar que a gente ia ter conseguido trazer tanta gente que a gente basicamente só conhecia por vídeos e blogs e posts na internet e e por algumas reuniões fortuitas que por acaso é, trouxeram, mas foi realmente uma, uma, uma bola de neve de acontecimentos desde, sei lá, ano passado uma visita do pessoal do PLOS que veio para o Brasil e aí acabou em contato com o Cameron, que acabou participando já no ano passado por videoconferência e tudo mais. Bom, uh, enfim, depois... A, o desenvolvimento da rede de Open Science for Development, e, enfim, nem preciso mencionar a colaboração, o pessoal, a Sarita, a Anne, o Luca, o Unirio, o Ibict, a UFJ, todos esses grupos que vieram aí. E, e à disposição de todos vocês de estarem aí até hoje, agora, depois de uma semana, nunca, acho que faz muitos anos que eu não ia numa conferência de uma semana inteira. Mas, justamente por isso, acho que seria muito legal a gente conseguir tirar algumas coisas e e compartilhar a nossa impressão sobre esse tempo todo que a gente passou junto aí, é, e que coisas a gente poderia pensar daqui para frente, acho que foi muita coisa foi conversada, é, acho que eu já fiz a minha é, breve reflexão superficial, mas é, uma das ideias que a gente que eu cheguei a conversar com algumas pessoas era tentar, a partir daqui, começar algum tipo de, acho que foi mencionado, um handbook, um guidelines, ou algum tipo de orientação para como outras pessoas, especialmente pessoas que estão em ambientes, é, em, em, em condições de, 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 de abrir apoios que a gente por si não consiga para esses para essas práticas, para esse movimento. Uh, como é que a gente pode, por exemplo, abordar uma agência de fomento? Como é que a gente pode abordar um colega? Como é que a gente pode abordar uh, um hackerspace? para que eles possam começar a, a, a ter uma, uma visão mais completa desse, de, de, desses processos, de como eles podem participar neles. Acho que tem muitas oportunidades que as pessoas nem reconhecem, nem sabem que existem. Uh, e de como a gente pode ir crescendo de forma mais, é, mais potente em nosso, nosso, nossas atividades. Né? Uh, acho que a gente tentou fazer uma sessão na quarta-feira de manhã, para tentar discutir um pouco essas questões mais de organização e tal, acabamos focando em outras coisas, que pode ter sido bom é, para a gente poder, talvez, retomar um pouco isso agora. É, então, duas, uma coisa que eu... A ideia, eu realmente gostaria de pagar, passar o microfone para quem teve está presente aqui, gostaria de compartilhar um pouco qual foi a experiência de participar desse seminário e do congresso e das oficinas. É, Antes disso, só queria fazer dois convites que acho importantes. Existem já dois espaços onde as pessoas é, têm se reunido para discutir isso. Talvez seja o caso de se criarem outros, mas é, existem duas listas de e-mail que acho que são bastante importantes nesse processo todo. Uma que é a lista do grupo, de, localmente falando, a lista do grupo de trabalho de ciência aberta, que é, é possível acessar através do site, nosso site ciênciaaberta.net. Uh, quando eu falo nosso, eu falo nosso, porque ele é organizado por todo mundo que estiver interessado, o blog é a mesma coisa. E a outra é a lista, essa lista é em português. Existe uma lista de e-mail em inglês, né, que a, a Open Knowledge Network é, hospeda, que é a Open Science... 
openscience.lists.okfn.org. Enfim, a gente repassa isso depois de maneira mais é, digital para todo mundo. A gente tem as inscrições de vocês, então temos os e-mails, e a gente pode fazer esse convite de uma maneira mais fácil de vocês clicarem depois. Mas acho que são espaços importantes, um para discutir as questões e avançar essas questões no âmbito do nosso país, e outra para discutir, se participar e se interar mais internacionalmente do que está acontecendo, do que e conhecer melhor esse pessoal todo que veio aqui nos visitar e compartilhar conosco, que continuam compartilhando até quando estiverem no avião, provavelmente, se tiver internet, hoje em dia tem, às vezes, já vão estar lá também. Eu posto que o Peter já tuita de avião, ou está muito próximo de se tornar alguém que faz isso. É só baixar o preço um pouquinho. É... Bom, é... então é isso. Eu gostaria de saber se... Salita? Ok. Quem, tiver, quem quiser pegar o microfone e compartilhar um pouco, para apresentar alguma ideia que gostaria de... Que, algum tipo de, de, de processo que gostaria de ver uh, começando ou continuando a partir daqui. É, é todo convidado. É, muito rapidamente, é, o Ali e eu havíamos até conversado um pouco é, uma ideia de que a gente poderia pensar, discutir isso né, online, seria gerar alguns documentos que auxiliassem aqueles que querem é, começar práticas de ciência aberta. Né? Então, é, de, de, de orientações, de, de links, né, de é, instrumentos, ferramentas, algo muito básico para a gente poder começar a usar isso justamente para aqueles públicos, né, como foi mencionado aqui algumas vezes, que não ainda não tem nenhuma familiaridade e que é, gostariam de dar um primeiro passo. Né, ou, inclusive, é, oficinas possíveis que podem ser armadas, enfim. Outro tipo de documento seria para as agências de fomento e de, né, de, das políticas de, de ciência e tecnologia, enfim, né? É, documento, algum documento que a gente pudesse sensibilizar e demonstrar a importância dessas agências de fato despertarem para essa questão e é, iniciativas práticas, como foi dito aqui pelo Jorge, enfim, né, de inclusão dessa questão no, nas suas, é, nos seus financiamentos, enfim. Então, a gente pensar na, na redação de algum documento de sensibilização, aí a gente tem que ver... É, a, talvez a diversidade de situações. No caso do Brasil, a gente precisaria certamente de um tipo de coisa assim. Né? É, então, era basicamente essas duas propostas que eu queria lançar para a gente ver se consegue começar a operacionalizar algum tipo de, de documentos nesse sentido. Né? Uma um lembretinho aqui, no, assim, mais operacional, é não, a gente depois mandem os links das apresentações é, eu sei que alguns estão já postados né, em vários lugares, porque tanto vai fazer parte do vídeo, né, quanto para a gente, muitas pessoas já perguntaram sobre as apresentações, para a gente poder botar no site do evento, junto com os nomes de vocês, para as pessoas poderem acessar. Né. Uh. So I just want to reiterate what's been said many times before and, and to once again thank the organizer, Sarita, Alex, and uh, Luca, um, and many of you there, Annie, uh, for bringing together such an interesting group of very different people who, who try to find common grounds on very complex issues. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll continue to search for these, these kind of common grounds, but I think this week's been a very good Uh, uh, start in that direction, and I agree with you completely that we don't want to just go away and then sort of forget about it. So we need to keep that momentum going, keep the documentation, the dialogues, and and the resources sharing uh, as part of this uh, uh, network growing. So I, and I also uh, shamelessly wants to remind you about the launch of the uh, the, the open science, open and collaborative collaborative science uh, in development network. Uh, that has an uh, overlapping mission with what you just mentioned. So we hope we'll work with you on that. Uh, and anybody else who wants to be a part of the network, again, you don't have to put in a proposal. Just being part of the network is sufficient. You know, you bring your expertise to it, and we, we will all begin this kind of network building. So uh, finally, I don't want to forget, too, is to reiterate what Peter said. 
very impressed with the students that are attending this uh, workshop, and uh, I wish as many of my students are interested in this topic as many of you here. Ma many of the students who are doing master PhD in this area and uh, and also practicing uh, open trying to practice open research, open science in your own uh, thinking and so forth. So this is very important. You guys are the next generation. Um, uh, you know, the old guys, a lot of them will not change. Uh, we'll count on you young folks to, to make the change and, and lead the revolution. Uh, so I'm very glad to see many of you uh, here in Brazil. And Brazil is the place to be. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so, firstly, I just wanted to mention another another document that came out of, um, or a, a proto document that came out of the uh, memorial symposium for Jean Claude um, in Cambridge, which was that we wanted to take um, some of these ideas, some of these rules, some of these these principles, and try and turn that into. We're not sure what kind of document yet, but the idea is to work starting from uh, Matt's six laws. Um, from the Open Source Malaria Project and to use the, 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 the guidance and the, the rules that Jean-Claude set, set down as a way of interrogating those and try to understand, back to the governance question, how um, we can really try and articulate what best practice would look like in, in the open notebook space. How do you create projects that work? Um, so there's a, I will liaise with Ali to provide a link to the Google Doc, as with all things, there's a Google Doc um, where we're starting to pull some of that, those resources together, but we really value um, contributions to that. Um, and then, yes, to echo Leslie's point, um, it's been an amazing collection of people and really to emphasize, particularly to the younger people in the audience, and I'm pretty sure I'm speaking for everyone who's come here from, from overseas, Use us as a resource to connect with other people. Get in touch. Um, let us connect with you. If we happen to be at meetings, use us to introduce you to people. Um, you know, that's, that's what most of us do, is, is connect people with each other. And so building those networks um, and building open networks is what um, we hope to, to hope to achieve in the longer term. Vou meio que fazer um, um, acho que um comentário adicional, é, mas antes é, ecoar um pouco as minhas palavras do, do Leslie uh, e do Cameron, também no sentido de que foi realmente uma semana, é, para mim, muito revigorante é, e inspiradora na, na maneira também de, de olhar novamente para a ciência com, com, uh, com uma nova paixão né, realimentada. Então, isso é, é muito bom, voltar para para o trabalho na semana seguinte, tendo uma semana é, de imersão né, bastante animadora. Né? Então, queria muito agradecer a todos, agradecer por todo o acolhimento né, da, da equipe organizadora e por tudo enfim, que eu aprendi e pude trocar com os colegas participantes. Né? É, enfim, eu acho que, além da... É, enfim, uma coisa muito óbvia da gente realmente trocar os nossos e-mails, as nossas apresentações, ter uma sistematização o uh, melhor possível né, no, no, no site lá da, da Ciência Aberta e tentar criar mesmo alguns documentos que sirvam de uma espécie de how-to ou tutoriais né, de, de apresentação. É, da minha parte, eu gostaria de fazer isso ecoar de maneira mais forte dentro da, da, da minha instituição, dentro da minha universidade. Então, vou tentar é, observar né, oportunidades de discussão e gostaria de enfim, no contato que eu farei com alguns de vocês, uh, perguntando sobre agendas, né, se estão passando pelo Brasil novamente ou não, para tentar organizar um encontro, né, uma apresentação de alguns de vocês na universidade junto com outros atores. Porque eu acho que a, a perspectiva que vocês trouxeram de diferentes campos de conhecimento né, é, teria um, um, um eco muito importante dentro da, da minha universidade, cuja área de origem ela é principalmente a área de, de medicina, de biomedicina, enfim, na área das, das biológicas e química também. Não é? 
É, enquanto eu venho das ciências sociais, às vezes lá a gente está criando novos cursos, ainda somos uma, uma, umas figuras um pouco estranhas dentro dessa instituição. Não é? É, e, por fim, eu queria também é, apontar acho que a, a importância de, uh, ao mesmo tempo que nós estamos fazendo aqui, não é, e saímos daqui com um, uma espécie de um mergulho vertical na temática da ciência, é, eu acho importante que é, esse movimento talvez aponte para uma transversalidade com outras iniciativas que têm uma agenda que é convergente, que é comum. Então, por exemplo, o campo da discussão da educação, não é? em termos de recursos educacionais abertos, uh, educação, uh, processos educacionais que envolvem também uh, acesso ao conhecimento, enfim, é, tem uma discussão importante que ela é muito análoga também ao que nós estamos discutindo aqui. São importantes aliados e que têm, acho que, uma possibilidade de impacto é, na sociedade bastante bastante grande. Não é? A discussão também que ocorre em termos de open data, open government, uh, também acho que são atores aí importantes na, enfim, no estabelecimento de uma conexão naquilo que tem a ver com acesso à informação, não é? abertura, transparência, enfim, são um pouco uh, agendas transversais que colocam o campo da educação, ciência, tecnologia, dentro de uma discussão mais ampla de conhecimento e democracia, né? ciência e democracia. Acho que é isso. É, queria agradecer o, a, a oportunidade de participar no evento. Foi um evento maravilhoso. Sarita, Ale, obrigado. Anne. Uh, as palestras de todos vocês foram muito boas. Eu adorei assistir todas. Uh, uma das coisas que eu mais gosto no movimento de Open Access é porque, via de regra, todos os nossos pares cientistas, embora eles estejam no, no limite do nosso conhecimento, explorando novas possibilidades, novas técnicas, novas ferramentas, muitas vezes eles são receiosos em fazer a ciência, em explorar as ciências. Eles exploram outro conhecimento, mas a forma de criar novo conhecimento não é explorada. E toda essa comunidade aqui reunida não tem esse medo de explorar novas oportunidades de como fazer ciência. Isso é, eu acho que nós somos todos muito corajosos em conseguir fazer isso. Obrigado. É, eu também gostaria de, de agradecer, principalmente também aos organizadores desse evento, né? Porque muitas vezes quando a gente começa a falar de coisas um pouco mais complicadas, como ciência aberta, a gente às vezes acaba caindo em alguns paradoxos, né? Mas eu acho que esse evento, acho que isso vem na minha mente agora, é, eu vim com a minha família, e a gente não é de instituição nenhuma. E a gente está dentro de uma academia, dentro de uma universidade, e foi aberto, né? Então, a gente teve um espaço aberto para estar aqui, dialogar, falar, dar ideias, participar dos workshops, e eu acho que isso é aberto. Eu acho que o aberto... É, ele partiu, é, o evento, enfim, não sei o que eu quero dizer, mas é, teve uma abertura no sentido de que a gente não é de uma instituição e pôde estar aqui participando, dialogando, discutindo ideias. E acho que isso é um exemplo fundamental de como deve ser ciência, né? Dentro dos seus paradoxos e quanto mais aberta a gente conseguir fazer da ciência, acho que ela vai chegar em lugares onde realmente precisa dela, né? que às vezes não chega. Então, a, a, talvez a ciência, a ciência pare de acabar num papel. Agora não é papel, porque é mais ecológico, né? ficou tudo digital. Mas talvez ela, ela comece a, a, a realmente chegar onde necessita de verdade, né? que são lá onde as pessoas estão vivendo, morando, nos lugares mais longínquos, onde as pessoas ainda não, não têm nem ideia do que é essa ciência, revolução que é, é dita há muitos anos. né? Então, eu só queria parabenizar a todos os palestrantes também. Foram... Ideias sensacionais, vinda de, de pessoas que estão dentro da academia, dentro da academia com um grande know-how, que eu realmente fiquei muito surpreso de ver pessoas é, com esse conhecimento, com essa já profundeza dentro da, das, das academias, com, com seus trabalhos maravilhosos, cada um aqui, é, abrindo e falando, toda essa sinceridade é, de, de que realmente querer uma mudança. E eu, eu sou um sonhador, e parece que isso é um começo de uma revolução dentro da ciência, e a mudança do mundo mesmo assim eu acho que acho que começa aí a mudança do mundo 
abrindo a ciência mesmo. Eu acho que, que é isso. Mais alguém? Ok. O Otto, eu sabia que o Otto queria falar alguma coisa. Inclusive, gente, se vocês aí da equipe quiserem dizer alguma coisa do som, aí fiquem à vontade. Não, eu não ia falar, mas está todo mundo falando, então eu vou falar. Eu não ia falar porque eu falo muito, daí eu falo muito besteira no, que eu, no meio que eu falo, mas enfim. É, eu tenho 20 e poucos anos só, estou basicamente começando a carreira acadêmica. E a gente que está nessa idade, a gente olha para o futuro e imagina o que, que vai ser, qual que é a carreira que a gente vai seguir. E principalmente quando você está trabalhando com áreas que são consideradas mais básicas, que não são, sei lá, engenharia, coisas que você tem uma grande oferta de trabalho no mercado de trabalho, é, você naturalmente se orienta para um futuro na academia. Mas esse não foi meu caso. Eu sempre quis é, fazer pesquisa, descobrir a o mundo, sabe? O universo, como as coisas são. Eu acho que todo mundo aqui tem um pouco disso, tem essa curiosidade, quer fazer isso. É, só que quando você olha para o futuro e imagina uma carreira que você pode seguir na academia, é meio frustrante, em certa parte, de você ver certas coisas que, de certo modo, estão claramente erradas, principalmente para quem é da minha geração, que está acostumado com tudo ser aberto e, e, e livre. Então, quando você encara uma perspectiva de uma carreira em que tem, em você tem que se submeter a critérios sobre o que é impacto, sobre o que é produtividade, que te desvio enormemente daquele aspecto fundamental que é simplesmente o fazer, compartilhar e descobrir e, e construir coisas, é meio frustrante. E, então, eu fico extremamente feliz de ver que Há uma alternativa de que, yes, we can, <risos> de que sim, há, há um, um, um outro caminho para se seguir, há um outro futuro possível e que as coisas não estão engessadas e que, sim, pode ser diferente aos poucos, enfrentando uma resistência que eu acredito que não é resistência técnica. A gente falou muito aqui sobre questões técnicas de se fazer ciência aberta, que é muito importante, mas, no fundo, vira uma questão mais que política, uh, ainda mais quando você não é ninguém dentro da academia, eu só sou um estudante de graduação. Então, se você propor qualquer coisa, qual o peso político do que você diz, entende? Uh, mas eu fico muito mais seguro de ter um posicionamento como esse, uh, depois de aprender muito com, todo, com todos vocês, com tudo que vocês falaram, e de saber que existem pessoas ah, como vocês que endossam esse tipo de possível futuro para a ciência, que é uma ciência mais...